Hey, hey, what's happening, everybody? Welcome back. This is another episode of The Strange Road. I'm your host, Mikey. As always, the bro host, Bub. And tonight, we got Stoner and Disbro on Master Control holding it down. Those guys are always dialing it in. Everything's been looking, sounding great. Stoner's killing it with the graphics. The show's looking on point. Thank you, guys. Uh, you're the best. And uh, let's get a little shot at the Master Control camera up there. What's up? <laughs> Oh man, this is uh, Bub. First of all, how you doing tonight? I'm great. You good? Yeah. You lose? Yeah. I don't really. It took me a minute to real. I just had to, you know, establish orientation, person, place, time. I was like, I'm not not really sure what day it is. And then I got. It. I was like, it's <laughs> Thursday. So, yeah. yeah, I'm great. I'm great. It's just there's a lot going on. Yep. Everything is happening at breakneck speed anymore. You know, yep. I feel like we're time traveling almost at this point. But it's good. It's good. Yeah. Cool. Lots happening. Well, we got a great show tonight, um, and, you know, we actually, uh, well, first of all, let's do a couple shout-outs. Yeah. Uh, you guys can find us at The Strange Road on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, uh, Facebook group, Strange Road Hitchhikers is there. I drop some links in there if you guys, uh, you know, start a conversation. We're there hanging out, um, and, you know, YouTube, the live streams, and the premieres, we always try to keep those completely ad-free. Yep. However, the super stickers and super chats are available if you guys want to check that out. Uh, check that out. It's a great way to support the show. Yeah. Uh, all the operations, everything we got going on down here. It helps out. And also like, subscribe, and share these videos. Yes. Uh, much, much appreciated. You guys can find us on Apple, Spotify, and Google, and everywhere else you find your podcasts. Give us that five-star rating and positive comment. Uh, we really do appreciate the heck out of all you guys. So thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Um, but tonight, we have a fantastic episode and um this person had reached out to me uh, emailed us and hit us up on instagram and we started chatting a little bit and it just so happened we're in another round of batch recordings and i love on it. another run i love it though. so that's we're what i'm starting, talking about this though. is starting our, our next run of batch recordings and so what a that's way to perfect. kick it off that's perfect though yeah that's perfect absolutely that's one of the things though too is like once you know again we kind of dabble in the strange right yeah. People that know us obviously kick stories like that to us in real life. Yeah. You know, friends, family, whatever. This They're is what like, we hey, started you, the you'd show you'd like for. this. You would, you'd be into this. We were whatever. hoping that people would reach out That's to us I'm and saying. say, hey, like, I have this insane story or I'm doing this and I think you guys would love this. Or, yes. I mean, that's the whole. It's the best part about it. You know. Let's help tell that story. Build Let's the arc. This. And, and then, I want to hear it. You know, hopefully. Yeah. Uh, it starts to take a life of its own. Yeah. So, I just I thought think. that was really interesting. I was like, you know, it's it's happening. Like that whole, yeah. like, it's, it's this like pipeline that's feeding itself now back exactly. to us of like, exactly. yeah, I want to hear that story. Are you right. kidding me? <laughs> exactly. Dial so, me in. Yeah, man. Let's introduce our guest for tonight. Uh, coming into the show virtually from Austin, Texas. Let's Nice. Please welcome Ohio native and host of the Chilling Podcast, and she's a supernatural explorer, Lindsay Brisbane. What's happening, Lindsay? What's How up? How are you? <laughs> What's up? I'm good. How are you all doing? We're doing great. Stellar. We're so stoked for this. <laughs> we are so happy that you reached out. Um, we've been checking out your your webpage, your your social media uh, platform. I mean, you're just killing it. The uh, your the series that you're doing, this 13 part series. I'm going to let you explain to everyone more in detail about that. But um, I mean, everything that you're doing is awesome. We totally resonate with. Uh, everything that's happening with this series, and it's a story that from natives from Ohio we'd never heard about. So, right. um, please tell us a little bit about yourself, and then how did you get to uh, basically creating this podcast series? And it's a, a real deep dive. Yeah. Um, but uh, tell us kind of how you got here. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, you know, I lived in what I call probably the most haunted house easily in Ohio. And I would venture to say, I jokingly say top five in America, but I mean, it's up there. It's a very haunted house. And I never got over it. And over the years, I work in, in media. So I worked a lot in Manhattan and on the West Coast. And people would hear my story and say, you should write a book. You should write a movie wow. script. And I would say, yeah, that's great. But those things sometimes just wind up on a desk and mm -hmm. nothing comes of it. Right. And so I, and I thought, 
nah, there's got to be something else. And I'm a huge podcast listener. Um, So when COVID hit, I said, man, I've got all this time. Why waste it? Let's go. And and I thought it would be... What, what a fool I am. I thought it would take me maybe six months to make it. And it took me three years to do this story. So it was wow. one wild ride. Yeah. Wow. wow. But I mean, I can tell that you've really put a lot it's of dedication. thought... And yeah. effort, and it's slick, and it's produced well. Love and it. so, um, you know, you're going to do something. You got to do it right. It takes three years. It takes three years, you know. But that's awesome. Let's yeah. See. And I thought, it's so funny. I thought when it came out, I was like, oh, maybe like 10 people listen to it, you know. And it's reached, <laughs> um, you know, top 200 out of all the podcasts in the entire world. So to have that happen, I couldn't believe it. I mean, I can, but I just never thought that it would get to where it got. Um, But, you know, people are spreading the word. So that's great. When did you start to notice it taking off when? Okay, so it took three years. But when did you launch it? And the the first series uh, went live or the first part? Um, So I launched it uh, this past October, and I'd say maybe a couple months ago, I really started seeing this rapid growth, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of listeners, fellow podcasters like you all, you know, being gracious enough to talk with me. Um, And then it kind of just exponentially just kind of snowballed and I just watched it kind of roll. So I was like, wow. And, you know, I never knew would people enjoy this story? You know, um, did I do a good job? The craziest thing I hear is everybody, I get a lot of, you know, questions from other podcasters, who's your production team? And I'm like, me, I did (laughs) the whole thing myself, uh, you know? very good. Yeah. So So yeah, and I had to teach myself everything and do all the research and tracking down eyewitnesses and writing 13 scripts. And, you know, I I onboarded this amazing musician. I was a huge fan of his. And I wrote him and said, do you think you could make me a a song for the show, like an intro or something? And he said, well, what's, what's the, what, what's your show about? And I explained it and he said, oh, you know, I'm not going to make you a song. You can use all of my music. That is amazing. And just give me a shout out. So I ended up having this amazing musician on there. So it's just been one really awesome thing after another with the story. So I'm just glad that more than just my mother, I love you, mom, but I'm glad that more than just my mother has listened to the show. <laughs> right. And that was one of my questions is who in the heck is doing the music? Cause that really stood out for me as the background music music as the episodes unfolding i mean it's a hundred percent i'm like that's not some you know in stock. elements yeah. stock or you know she's got somebody doing legit you know custom music so man that'd be so much fun it's, though right to do like a like a score like a soundtrack to like a series like that i think would be fun yeah yeah, and I lucked out. His name is Sidewalks and Skeletons. His name is actually Jake. He's from England. And I Very listened cool. to him for years. He actually makes music that I guess is categorized in some areas is called like witch house music. So mm. just think like spooky techno. Yes. And I, That's yeah, great. and I had it's <laughs> so good. And and I had listened to him for forever, like his first two albums. And so I just reached out and um you know, when he heard my project and heard what it was going to be, um, without question, he said, use it all. Just give me a shout out. So at the end of every episode, I give him a little shout out and anything I use his music on an Instagram, I take him all the time. And, you know, so, and I hope his numbers grow too, because I get a lot of people that are like, now I can't stop listening to his music. Thanks a lot. So, well, we'll be following him. That's yeah. It really stands out. So kudos to him. He, he crushes. Oh, and that's also oh, yeah. the power of, you know, some of the social media and, and things like this when you get into the community. Like, I think we've felt that way ever since we we started up about the same time or restarted the podcast about the same yeah. time she's bringing out her yeah. series, right? So yeah. getting that kind of love and warmth from the community itself and, you know, having other podcasters and getting that interaction really kind of helping us figure out this space in general. Like, I can definitely identify with what you're saying as far as that goes, too, of that reciprocation. No, that's fine. Go use it. I'm glad it's getting used out there. That's going to, you know, mm-hmm. get me a, you know, people are going to hear my music now. That's great. Like that's the way yeah, I, why not? It, I love that kind of stuff. Yeah. People helping people. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Plus it's, it's super spooky and I can't imagine anything else in that podcast. So witch I'm house just so music. grateful. Yeah. Yes. Witch house music. Who knew? Awesome. But I've loved it for years. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there you it. go. Yeah. I'm going to listen to that tomorrow. 
Yeah, Lindsay, we'd, we'd love to hear. I know it's a 13-part series. I understand there's so much detail, but if there's kind of just a, a, a summation of the story kind of overarching yeah. and then maybe we get in some of the details, but, um, but you know, kind of where, when this takes place, mm-hmm. let's kind of set the stage for everybody. Yeah, so we'll set the stage. It was about 2003 in Kent, Ohio, and I had been living with three other roommates. There were four of us in this house we really loved on Ohio Street, Um, and our one roommate was moving in with her boyfriend, so now there was only going to be three of us, and um, we didn't want to not live together, Um, so... You know, we talked to our current landlord. We were such great tenants. He's like, maybe I can help. He's like, I can't find anything. He reached out to everyone he knew. We were looking at ads. This is before the internet, by the way, is what it is at all now. There was no social media. So trying to find stuff also was like, you had to like literally call, like, you know, or look at newspapers and things. And we could not find anything. We called every apartment building. And then finally, someone suggested, hey, I used an actual realtor's office downtown in Kent, uh, you know, maybe they can help you, you know? So, you know, and I can go into this, this on its own is weird. So we go to see this realtor, we get an appointment with this woman. She's like middle-aged, nice enough. We are in her office without exaggeration, probably 45 minutes. I remember I was sitting in front of her desk. My other two roommates are standing behind me and she's just going on and on about how there are no three bedroom homes or apartments or anything. Like you are not going to find anything, no townhouses, nothing. You either all need to split up or you need to share a room. And she keeps showing us like different apartment buildings with two bedrooms, all this stuff. And we're just going, that's not why we're here. Like if there isn't anything, there isn't anything. And finally we get kind of frustrated and ready to leave. And um, she goes, hang on a second. Like literally I'm out of the chair. We're walking out the door. She goes, whoa, 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 hang on a second. I might have something. And like out of a horror movie, you know, she turns around to a metal filing cabinet, opens it up, pulls out a manila envelope, puts it on her desk and slides it across. And I sit back down and I open it up and there's this cute little house. And she goes, this is three bedrooms. And I remember my one roommate, Rebecca, especially when we left here, she said, what the heck? Why would you keep us there for 45 minutes? Right. And then at the end, when we're going to leave, now there's a magical three bedroom house. And she said something to the effect, the landlords are incredibly particular. So, but if you guys really want it, I can reach out. And we're like, obviously, like we've been here, of course, you know. And we go to see the house for the first time. And this is extra weird as well. So it's two full grown men in their they're middle aged. And I hadn't seen a lot of properties. And what I can say now as an adult is usually when you go see a rental of any kind, you maybe meet with one person, they say hi, bye, and you fill out an application and you just go look around. Like they maybe stay in like the kitchen or something, but you just wander around, right? They made the five of us stay in a group. So we're talking three grown women, two grown men hunched together in this tiny house. I mean, the house is so small that if I stood in the kitchen, I could stick out my arm and be in the living room and the dining room. Like this is a little house, right? And I remember at one point going to try to go upstairs and they said, whoa, 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 get back here. We will go there in a second. So we're scooting from like little room to little room, right? And they're Right. And they're making us stay in this little group. And it's so strange. And they're asking us all these personal questions, especially me. They won't stop talking. Like they never stop talking. Right. And so it seemed like an odd vibe, the realtor's office looking at the house with them. Mm. But then it, but then it gets a little weirder. One of the bedrooms was actually had inside of it, the door to the basement. And my good friend, Amber, who is afraid of nothing, she doesn't believe in the paranormal. She doesn't care. She goes, who, you know, I'm like, I don't want a basement door in my bedroom. And my other roommate, Rebecca's like, oh, Amber's like, babies, I've got it. I don't care. <laughs> so we go into this room and we see a basement. And as someone from Ohio, a basement is like, whoa, what a bonus. Like, especially renting, you're like, let's see this thing. Yeah. And we, and we go to go down there and instantly these two guys are like, 
no, 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 no. You don't, you don't need to see the basement. Like it's, it's just an old basement. You don't need to see it. My roommate, Rebecca, like takes off down the stairs. She's not having it. We all go down now. We get down there and you're just like, wow, this is a really old basement. Now one half was like a mix of like dirt and gravel. And there was like a, and there was like a small section that was like kind of paved and all the walls were still stone. You could actually see dirt under one part of this Mm -hmm. house. So we're talking the original foundation basement. And once we get down there, these two guys immediately are like, okay, you've seen it. Let's get upstairs. And my roommate, Rebecca, looks around this thing and she goes, what's that? And they go, oh, that's nothing. Come on, let's go, let's go. (laughs) And I remember we kind of peek around and I saw like some graffiti or something. And then they kind of rushed us and we get upstairs. So when we first move in, the first thing we do is we're going to check out the basement because they were like, you guys can have the house. And the whole situation was so weird and everything else, but we really wanted to live together. And when you're like 21, you don't know how weird that experience was. Like the whole thing, looking back now that I'm 41, Mm -hmm. I'm like, that is insane. Right. Like if my, if my, if my niece or something or nephew told me that, I'd be like, don't live there. Something's wrong. (laughs) But (laughs) right. (laughs) But at the, (laughs) <laughs> right i'd be like they're gonna murder you or something 100%. or there's some sort of cult <laughs> yeah there's like a cult like this is that. not good I love right that. but at the time as a 21 year old with no experience uh and no real internet access you know there's no like creepypasta stories or anything right. at the time like i am just like we're grateful to be there so we move in day one and the first thing we do is we got to go check out that basement whatever that stuff was and i'll this is already just sets the stage. We turn the corner and we stand in front of the graffiti and it's Rebecca, myself, and Amber. Now, Amber doesn't believe in anything. I mean, not even really religion of any kind. Rebecca's kind of, oh, I kind of believe and I'm kind of tapped in. I do have kind of abilities. And these three people with three different kind of vibes in life look at this and I'll never for Rebe- forget Rebecca saying, is that like a cult or Satanistic what are we looking at? Mm -hmm. And my, my roommate, Amber says, there's something wrong. This, there's something wrong with this. And I remember just getting this feeling in my stomach of, I think we're in trouble. Mm -hmm. Like I just knew instantly looking at what we were looking at. And it was this large circular thing not like if some dudes in a metal band were like Satan and like yeah. put up a pentagram, right? Yeah. Or like some witchy weird chicks are down there, you know, doing craft stuff. Like, no, like this looked like something ancient and really mm. weird that I have never seen before. And we're looking at it. It even looked like it was put there in a, like a long time ago. And I just knew oh no, this is not good. And so my roommates and I were like, we're never going down there again. Like throw a couple things and lock the door. No one's going down. Um, And so that kind of sets the stage just to start for you all. Day one in this house and how we got there. Wow. I was going to say right away that the graffiti, I'm like some kind of satanic mark, you know, that instantly... I've seen enough haunted shows and, and you know, the 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 haunting and those to where it's like, yep, you know, bought a house and then in the basement there was a pentagram on the floor and then all this started happening. You want to know what I've got as a comparison to that? The house we were in in Columbus years ago and we saw the, the graffiti of Frodo lives. We had like this beautiful Lord of the Rings reference, not like some pentagram satanic culty. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not hanging out there. I don't know how you. But you guys had wow. already signed the, wow. the lease and everything, so you were locked in. There was no backing out, and you're just like, oh, we pray that you know, just lock this thing up. And I, but so the realtor, can I? Can we just? Can I? Yeah. Oh yeah. That whole Manila made, envelope yeah. of kind of like, if these, sorry, if these girls are crazy enough, like here's this, you know, whatever I, stir of echoes. I don't. know. They vetted you. Like it's just. Absolutely, 100%. And looking back as grownups and putting this whole story together in this podcast, what I realized is a few things. That's why the realtor was so hesitant. Mm -hmm. She clearly knew either these landlords were weird or there was something odd with this house. There's no reason to make people sit there for 45 minutes and then do it in such a like clandestine, strange, like out Mm -hmm. of the envelope it comes, right? Strange stuff. 
But what was also a big red flag looking back was these two landlords literally wouldn't let us be in the house alone or in a room alone Fruit. and never stop talking. And mm -hmm. they never, so we couldn't be in any right. space alone without sound. Mm -hmm. And knowing what I know about the house now, oh, there's good reason. Oh, I see. Okay, okay. Here's, wow. here's another that question all back to the, the realtor too of the, the trial kind of like the, you guys were... Like, okay, Mike and I have been friends since literally kindergarten, six years old. We've known each other a long time. Like, if we were in the same scenario and we had one of our other friends and we were like, hey, we're, we're going to get this house. And we're going to, we like, I think we'd be 21. pretty determined. And, and I can see that. So that's why I'm kind of gauging, too. Like, you girls were all in this, like, You're we're, we're, we're like, we're, we've got that bond, right? Like, Mm -hmm. We're going to stick and together, I, I, I guess, if things do get weird. She's testing like, well, they seem they seem like they like each other and they really all want to live together. So they And I had had stuff. something. Yeah. And I had something happen the previous year. I talk about it in the first episode. Unfortunately, I was in this really crazy, really, this on its own could be its own true crime show, but I was stalked by this guy and oh, almost wow. kidnapped and wow, really crazy. Yeah. Really crazy story. So my two roommates had spent the year, um, basically told by the police you need to escort her to her classes pick her up like i had a crazy year you'll hear about in episode one but um so part of the reason we needed to stay together was just for my safety mm -hmm. on top of like we're really good friends like i knew rebecca since high school i only met amber in college but it was instant like we were just instantly good friends i mean still great friends to this day That's so on so first it was like you know, we need to make sure Lindsay doesn't get like murdered. And then, you know, we're really good friends. So let's stay together. Um, so it was just <laughs> extra important, which also I can tell, you know, when we were trying to look so hard, I think that's why else we were so tenacious because we were just like, they did. I don't think either one of, one, one of them wanted me living, you know, without the three of us, at least, you know. That's a really interesting point of the story, too. I mean, that's like when your friend, whoever's telling you this is movie quality. They're not joking, like, because 100%. if it's any other scenario, right, if it's just like, well, I guess we're going to have to draw short straws here and maybe Mikey doesn't live in the house or I don't live in the house or whoever the other person is. I haven't but, heard the story yet, and I'm like, I guarantee in five years, there's, somebody's going to make a movie about this. Probably or a her. Netflix series. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I would love to see it. Now, anyways, yeah. sorry, we digress. I'm going to put my hands no, inside this no. pouch and keep myself <laughs> yeah, from uh, getting too animated I here. guess the next steps, so you guys are, I mean... Is there a sense – so you you move in and you guys are living there and take us No from, one goes in the basement. Yeah, and you guys stay completely clear of the basement, but everything's However, working out. There's a bedroom with a basement door. Basement door. Oh. And, and, and can I ask real quick? She wasn't scared at first. After seeing the cultish graffiti, whatever, was she still kind of like whatever? So we had to pull straws. Yeah, like Amber's the kind of person who – like she's the kind of person just to save a penny would come home to a house and keep all the lights off mm. and would just be like, why waste the money? And I'd be yeah. like, aren't you scared of like spooky stuff or someone's in the house? She's like, no, that's so stupid. So she was such a level headed human being yeah. that she saw the graffiti and went, no need to come down here. But then was like, my bedroom door shut. So it doesn't matter. Like it never faced her. If that was me, I would be like, I can't live in this room. Like no. I'm moving in with one of you. I can't live with a basement door bad mm -hmm. enough but, to a creepy basement. Yeah. <laughs> but that's where I also think in those friendship uh, 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 hierarchies, maybe the stratification of like, not a hierarchy, but just the strengths of people, right? Like yeah. you obviously have a strength as like this empathic, intuitive, you know, uh, able to kind of sense certain things as well. Right. Yeah. Maybe she's not on that ride, but you know, has that just logical, stoic, logical. I'm going to just, you know, be very she doesn't clinical about this. Yeah, she can yeah. see it. Yeah, perfect person to stay in that room. Yeah, like the uh, we had the one guest perfect. where his brother said his brother was, you know, like a scientist or something. So he saw the shadow person and went back to sleep because he was like, nope, it's not real. Yeah. Right, oh, like right. so, it had two very different experiences mm -hmm. of how they interpreted never, it. Never because, affected him. Right, he was like, "Ah, eh, I'm going back to bed." Shadow play on the wall. So, yeah, that's and that's and that's and that's exactly how Amber was. So, like, yeah, we all had these different personalities that like suited us being friends and living together and going through that traumatic first year we we had the year prior together um, in that house. But so we get there, and here's what's crazy: like people 
ask me about the house and just go like, you know, how did it happen? And, you know, in movies, I feel like it's like a slow burn to that climactic moment where the family freaks out and they're running out of the house. This haunting started for me day one. This Mm. wasn't some slow leading up to it. Really? I, yeah, immediately I went. Insta-haunt. Okay. Insta-haunt. This was not, you know, within the first week, you know, I can tell you guys some of the things that were going on, but it was instant. There wasn't Mm. even a question. Um, So for me, the first thing I noticed was I felt like I was being watched. And Mm -hmm. as somebody who's kind of tapped in and has abilities, I always tell people, we all know that feeling. Like you could be in a line at a grocery store and be like, dude, I think someone's staring at me. And you'd like, look, and you catch someone looking at you and they look away awkward. Well, you know, we've all had that. So it feels exactly like that. And I had this feeling everywhere I went, the kitchen, the bathroom, it didn't matter where I was in my bedroom. I would be like, there is something following me around this house and it is watching me. Mm. So I don't know where this came from. I had two of these incidents, like where I had courage, which, you know, I don't know where this came from in me, but I was in my room and in the corner near the windows, I could tell something was standing there watching me. So this is, I'm not kidding you. This is day one. And I went and I walked right up to it. I thought if there's something there, I'm walking up to it. And I took my hand and I stuck it into the corner and I felt a cold mass, huge. And I had heard about in movies, people talking about this cold feeling. Um, And with all the experiences I've had in my life, I've never felt the actual cold that people Mm -hmm. talk about until that moment. And that's why the show's called The Chilling. I I put my hand in and I felt this chilling feeling and thought, there's something there. And I kind of back... great name. Yeah, right. Yeah. Great name. Yeah, that's great. (laughs) Well done. Jeez. um. Yeah. And so when I felt it for the first time, I went, holy smokes, like in all these, you know, stories I hear, this is what people talk about. And I've never in all my life experienced this. So um, the next thing, this isn't in the podcast, by the way, but I'll share it with your with your listeners because and uh, viewers because it's so crazy. So I for the first time in my life, I had a big closet. The room I was in would have been, this was a very old home. So the room I was in would have probably been the master And when I say a big closet, nothing like we have in the modern conveniences, but it was big. Like I could walk in it and it was this squared shaped closet. And so I I got to have this room and it was great because it was a little bit bigger and I I was an artist. So I had all this art stuff and and basically I didn't really keep a dresser of drawers because the way the uh, closet was, I had all these kind of like a higher shelf. I could put all my clothes just stacked and then have like two or three little like shelves in there and hang everything. So I was like, I don't even need like a dresser at all in my room. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have one. And so the first thing I felt was, you know, I went to put my stuff in the closet and when I went to go into the closet, so again, this is all week one, I got that sensation. Like if you accidentally wandered into the cave of a bear, like I walked in and I went back away slowly, like keep your eyes forward and slowly back away. Damn. And I, yeah, and I thought, am I nuts? Like, what the heck? And I went to go in again, same feeling, back away slowly. So now I'm like, well, I can't go in my closet. Like, Jeez. I have this huge closet and I can't use it. So on the outer edges, I hung up like a couple of like nicer things. And on the floor next to my wall, because I didn't have a dresser, I got rid of it because I moved into this room and thought, oh, I don't need it. Look at all the space. Yeah. I now have on the floor next to my wall, folded and stacked, all my clothes, my undies, my socks are just on the floor because I can't go in my closet. So I'm like, what the heck? And my roommates are like, what are you doing? And I'm like, oh, you know, I didn't want to say anything because Amber doesn't believe. So what what is she going to think? And I was like, oh, I'm just organizing or something, I think is what I said. And they're like, okay. Um, And then I'm just in my room and the closet door had one of those antique old handles. So when you shut this door, it was very heavy and well-made. This house was an older home. It was well-made. So when you shut the door, it shut. Mm -hmm. But I'm sitting there and you can just hear the jiggling of the handle. And I would look over and I would see it Mm. moving. And then I would see it turn and just open a quarter of the way. And I remembered thinking, okay, like you already know that there's something watching you. Now there's something in in your closet. Every child's fear, the monster in the closet, you actually have one. 
And now you just are seeing this open. And I would kind of just try to ignore it sometimes and it would happen and I'd see it out of the corner of my eye jiggling and opening. And so I would get up and shut it eventually. I would try to not like feed into the energy. I would just be like, whatever it is, is trying to get your attention. Just pretend like you are like, oh, what, what's this? The closet's open. Go shut it. Like <laughs> right. I never tried to react with fear. I really tried to put on like a, oh, even though clearly whatever was in there was like, she can't even come in here or put her clothes in. But still I was just like, oh, you know, just act casual. And then one day the closet jiggled. I watched it turn and it, the door opened a quarter of the way, which is what it always did. Enough to make you say, maybe it is an old house. Mm -hmm. It always just opens to that point. I'm looking at the door and something takes it and slams it all the way open. Wow. Like hits the wall open. And when I saw that door move, stop, and then with force get slammed open, I thought, this is really bad because now, now I'm getting a sense that it can actually move things for real. Mm -hmm. So at that point, if I tried to keep it shut, the door handle would not stop jiggling. So I actually propped it open. And now I'm having to sleep in my room at night with this door. I had to stack all this stuff against oh, it. No. And now just you got to keep it open. Wow. <laughs> and I'm peer at night peering into this dark closet. <sighs> knowing something's in there I and it was oh. te terrifying when the door so, would open would yeah. it be like once a day yeah multiple times a day at night if you would go and close it like if it cracked that quarter way and you closed it did it happen again so this is kind of how it worked and this is what's interesting and feeds into what was in the house and like i said i couldn't put all these stories in there were just too many um yeah but what I realized was there was no pattern. I could shut it and it would stay shut. It only seemed to open at times when it knew it could scare you the most. Mm. So if it was at night, absolutely. If you're winding down for bed and just reading a book alone, it would open. You might be in your room alone, like stressing out working on homework. Like I'd be working on some sort of art project or something and I have to be in there. All my stuff's laid out. I'm working, I'm stressed and it would start to happen. And I would be like, and now I can't leave the room because I have to stay in here to finish my work. So it would selectively pick times mm. to do it and there would be times where especially early on if i shut it it would happen right after as if to be like this is not a figment of your imagination mm. and at first i thought oh old house old door but then the pattern would switch to something where i could shut it and it wouldn't open for days and days and days and then i might be doing something and then it would do it then and so by the end of probably week 2 is when i was like nope door's getting pinned open we're done with this like i and now i'm peering in, every night into this dark closet which was just terrifying oh my jesus oh my yeah so then this leads into this story also not in the show but uh so creepy yes. So I'm laying in bed and the way that my bed was, um, it was pushed into the corner of the room and I had my nightstand with a little light and I, at the time, loved to read books a lot. Um, so I, I would read, turn off the light, put the book down and I would almost kind of sleep on that side of the bed, not the side closest to the wall. So I finished reading, turn off the light, put my book down, I roll over. And as soon as I roll on my side, so my back is to what would be the closet and the door. I feel somebody take their knees or like thighs and like push hard against the bed so that the mattress even shakes. Like that distinctive feeling of somebody like kneeling on a bed mattress. Like that just, just made pushing me feel so in. uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So uncomfortable. That's so, just a terrifying thought. <laughs> Oh my God. And I'm alone. And keeping in mind what I told you about what happened the year prior, I remember, you know, my first instinct is, is this guy in the house? Like my original instincts with some stuff like that was extra scary because it was like, I actually have somebody trying to stalk me. So like, oh God. And I felt a person. And so I thought, well, if somebody's in here, mm -hmm. I got to see. And I rolled over and there was nobody there, but I looked at the mattress and I could see the indentation. Wow. So again, I don't know where or how I got the the courage here, but I took my arm out from my blanket and I stuck my arm out and I went into this cold mass 
And I kept going until my hand came out the other side. And so now my hand is the temperature of my room. And from like my, like just below my wrist up to like my elbow is inside of the mass. And I remember waving, yeah. And I remember waving my hand side to side and leaving it and going back into it. And Immediately, I pulled my arm out. I rolled back over like a kid. I put the covers over my head. And as soon as I did that, I felt the knees lift off the mattress and like my whole mattress shook. And I just kind of felt it go back into the other side of my room. Oh my God. So this thing had definition. I mean, there was a parameter of coldness. Well, and where, weight, mm-hmm. density, yeah, and exactly. The, physical elements of some nature, right? Or an ability to affect physical elements. It's maybe like, itself yeah. in yeah. this general vicinity because you're putting your hand through it, and your your you said your hand was warm, but all the rest, whatever was in the mass, is cold. So it's like measuring the the the. That is wild. Going, See, you know, I've yeah, heard people walking at. through. You know, you you walk through a place that gives you the creeps. Or you're you're feel like you're being watched. You get goosebumps. You you feel this cold element when you open up a closet door. You hear these things, but I've never heard anybody describe sticking their hand through these masses mm. and explaining it the way you like. That's a very unique number one. Like kind of ballsy, ballsy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, dude i damn. was thinking the same thing like I, there's i'm not even i'm not out doing under the covers yeah. it ain't happening i'm putting the snorkel on getting right under there damn Lindsay, you're brave braver than than i <laughs> it's probably well that didn't so last long to eat anymore you know as a kid i did didn't last lot. long oh. yeah it didn't last long unfortunately yeah and so like that's all just week one. And also keeping in mind, I don't talk, maybe I bring this up a little bit in the show, but like I'd be on the living room couch with Amber, the non-believer, and we would be there and kitchen cabinets would just pop and just slowly open, like in ways that are not possible. And and I'm sitting there knowing what's going on in my room and throughout the house with someone else. And she would just look over and go, eh, it's an old house. And she would get up and just slam it shut. And I'd be sitting there like, Oh my God. Oh my God. And no matter how many times these little things would happen when she was around every time for her, eh, it's just an old house. And I would be horrified going, she, I I would think to myself, that thing just opened that. And Amber just so violently would get up and slam it shut and be like, ah, stupid old house. And I'd be like, oh, wow. Damn. Yeah. So, so we were also having activity throughout the house that, you know, Amber was noticing, but not noticing, you know, Mm -hmm, because she, if you, if you don't, if you don't believe you will always find a rational explanation, you just will. Um, but then this really weird thing happened. My roommate, Rebecca, who I had known since high school, we literally went to prom together. We lived together for two years prior to this. Um, she moves into her bedroom, which was at the bottom of the stairs and she never came out. And I don't mean like, I'm not exaggerating. We're talking, when is she eating? When does she go to the bathroom? This is someone we cooked meals together, you know, multiple times a week. You know, you guys have been friends since you were young. When you're friends with somebody, you hang out all the time. Like, especially before you're like in serious relationships, like you're just doing stuff together whenever you're together. And to have somebody you've known that well, um, go into a room, shut a door to a point that you're like, is she going to the bathroom in a bucket? Like what's going on in there? Should we call her parents? Has she hurt herself? What's happened to our friend? And my my roommate, Amber, who's a non-believer in the paranormal, but she instantly was like, there's something wrong here. Like yeah. not necessarily paranormal, but with our friend, like what is going on? And you would knock on the door and ask her, hey, you know, are you in there? Are you okay? And she would open it and be like, what do you want? Ooh. And she'd be so angry. Oh, good and- God. And and you would be out. like, yeah. And you would be like, I just, are you okay? Can I get you anything? She goes, I'm fine. Leave me alone. And she would like shut her door. So everything that ended up happening in the house with Rebecca, you know, we didn't speak for a decade mostly mm. until I made, the, I made the show or started to make the show. And we had spoken a little bit, but really we didn't speak for years. Mm. And, um, So when I started to make the podcast, I finally really got to talk to her. So we hadn't spoken for like a decade and then we hadn't spoken for like longer than a decade. And this would be the first time I would hear what was going on because I said, you know, 
you wouldn't talk to us. So I have no idea. Like, what were you doing in there? And um, she explained. And I asked her, why would you isolate yourself? Like, why? And she said, because you guys were torturing me. You were teasing me. What? You were doing things to play, to play tricks on me. Oh my and I said, God. And I said, like, what? And she said, I would hear your voice outside my door, whispering and laughing. So I was like, (laughs) and I was like, explain this to me. Like, what do you mean? And then she openly said, okay, well, here's the thing. Looking back, she goes, all I can say is that something got into my mind when I was in that house and I became incredibly angry and paranoid. And so I would hear you or, or be experiencing these things that I thought was you playing pranks. But here's the thing. I'd hear it and open the door and nobody would be there. Oh my or, God. Or no one would even be home. One time she said she saw feet under the door and flung the door open. And not only was no one there, she was home alone. And she said, so clearly looking back now, removed from the house, it wasn't you because you weren't even there. Right. But... In my mind, this manifestation of you torturing me and teasing me made me furious. And I just didn't want to interact with you guys at all. Even though, yeah, yeah. That sucks. Mm -hmm. That that kind of breaks my heart. Like, there's so much time lost and and, you guys could have been resources to each other. But it's a typical divide and conquer with these entities. I mean, you hear these stories are pretty common. I've I mean, heard stories like you know, this. The brother and the sister. The talking or outside like the doors. The mother and the father all of a sudden hate each other. They're on the brink of divorce because, you know, the, the mother, whoever's in the house, there's something that's trying to divide everybody within it. I'm just going to say this is in that I don't truly believe that my house is haunted. But there is a certain cabinet in my house that every time it's open now, I just send a picture of it to my wife because I know it's not me that's not shutting it. And she swears that she's shutting it, but it's always open. Anyway. Put a ring cam on that thing. I'm going to have to just, I just literally keep taking a picture message of it and sending it to her. I'm like, well, it, can you not shut this? And she's like, I do. I'm like, and our shit, our house is old too. It's from like 1910. I don't even want to go down that road. Like, I don't yeah. want to start thinking that. Uh, yeah. We'll leave that one. Yeah, but put up a ring cam. Yeah, but put up a ring cam. See what happens. Because in our house, I mean, and it would do it in ways that, again, what was in the house was highly intelligent. Mm -hmm. And it did things to really mess with you, like to scare you. And so like, this is another story that goes into Reba and the stairwell. This is really, it plays into the story much later, but um, I didn't fit this one in the podcast either. But so the stairwell to my room was really weird. And it was very small. Again, it was an old home. So it's this tiny little stairwell, very tube-like feeling. And it didn't actually open with railings to the living room. So it was like walled off. So when you walked up it, you just felt like really confined and tight. Yeah. And I always had that feeling like when you were a kid and you went in the basement and you had to come upstairs alone and you just start running because something would hit you. Go. Yeah. Go. go. Right? Got, yep. Go. Get going. <laughs> And so here I am as a grown up in even pure daylight, right? And I would go to go up these stairs and I would get that feeling inside of me like a kid, like run for your life. But I would be like, I'm not going to run for my life. Like, this is ridiculous. But why do I feel this way? So I thought, you know what? I was an art student. I had these large scale canvases. When I say big, I'm talking like enormous canvases. And I would paint paintings all the time and I had all this artwork. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to hang all this stuff up instead of keeping it in this little weird spare room upstairs. And then that way, like maybe it'll feel less creepy in this hall. So I lined this stairwell with all these paintings and I would come home to Rebecca. She would hear me come in the house and she'd swing over, open her bedroom door and she would go, look. And in front of her door, and we're not talking like crooked or weird we're talking neatly stacked every single one of my canvases would be off the wall she would hear them fall and then they would be perfectly stacked in front of her door what yeah wow. and yeah i don't even and know so, what to say right now like that it's, that's more than my brain can handle and i can see why she might have that's playing mind Shit, games. man, I might have cracked. That's playing mind I might have cracked hard. Yeah. Especially at that age and mm-hmm. your, your 20s. Like, 
you're in school, you, you're trying to figure out life, like you're getting haunted on, things are, you know, stacking tapestries and artwork outside of your door and you're seeing, like, it's a lot. That's a lot. That's a lot. I might have yeah. a tough time with that. Yeah. So she would open and then it got, it kept happening. And so one day I remember her opening the door and just being like, you know, fix it, like fix your shit. Like Lindsay, like, how can you not hang this up? Do it. And I was like, okay, okay. So my, my then boyfriend, now husband, Adam, he's like, babe, you know, he's like, listen, babe, clearly you just don't know how to hang these up. I'm going to help you. <laughs> and he was also really puzzled because he would come home with me sometimes to angry Rebecca with these stacked in front of her door. And again, if they looked all crooked and weird, you'd just be like, they fell. But they looked mm -hmm. like someone took them off. But she would hear it and be so angry about how loud the sound was. So he's very confused. So he's like, I got you, babe. Clearly, you don't know what you're doing. I'm going to do it. I'm like, okay. And he does the craziest thing I've ever seen. And they were those clear tacks. And he took hundreds of them, hundreds. He put them behind the canvases and around the entire edge mm. of each canvas. Then... And he's like, I don't care if we ruin the walls. At this point, it was like a science experiment. He's like, <laughs> then, then he took tape and actually taped the canvases to the wall, like over my paintings. Like he's like, I hope you don't care. I'm taping this down. He used duct tape, by the way. He duct taped. So we've got hundreds and hundreds of tacks surrounding, I'd say like four giant canvases. I probably had a couple little ones too, but I remember the four big ones. And so he's like, nothing's bringing this down. You're fine now. I was like, thank you. This looks ridiculous, but thanks. <laughs> and sure enough, I come home from school. I hear before I even turn the corner to the stairwell, Rebecca swings open the door and just goes, look. Oh, and God. there is not a single tack left in the wall. Not a single tack. The entire car, car it was carpeted stairs and a carpeted floor. The whole stairs are covered in tacks. The floor is completely covered in tacks. There's not even a piece of tape left on the wall. The tape is just on the stairs. Like mm. if somebody pulled it off and put it down and stacked in front of her bedroom door are all the canvases. I... What did your husband, boyfriend at the time, husband now say? Yeah. Did he think you're, did he go like, we're going to talk about doing, our relationship? Somebody's doing Are this. you messing with me now? Like, is this some kind of like. Is there a homeless person that's sneaking in the camera house camera show? messing with you guys? Yeah. What is this? What did he think? I rem He just said that that's not possible. I do think yeah. this is a vague memory now that you're asking me because no one's asked me that in a long time. He actually might have said to me, maybe Rebecca's doing it. Yeah. Like, to herself. Right. Like, that's I think my thought initially. That, yeah. That's to mess point. with you to mess with you. And I think he said, maybe Rebecca's like, she's obviously doing weird stuff in that room. We all know her. He knew her since high school too. He yeah. goes, we all know her. She's not like this. Maybe she's doing it to mess with you. And so then I was like, wow, I never considered that. Like, okay, like maybe that's it. Um, but clearly that was not the case on any anybody's part um, because things just continue to amp up from there beyond control. What did the independent party of the house, was it Amber? Yes, Amber. What did she think about all of this as this yeah. was going on in these scenarios specifically? Amber would just be like, I'm so busy between work and school. Like, don't bother me with stupid stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, is, is Rebecca okay? Like, did yeah. you see her? Like, she would more be like, she came out of her room. What did she say? I'm like, she's mad. And I think Amber was like, well, don't hang them up anymore. Like, stop causing problems. She's mad enough. And I'm like, you don't understand what I'm trying to tell you. So, you know, the level-headed person of the house, of course, remained level-headed and said, put your canvases away and stop hanging stuff up on the stairs then, you know? Um, even when Adam was like, Amber, like, and Adam and Amber were actually really good friends, the two of them. And he would even be like trying to explain it to her. And she'd be like, I, whatever, just don't hang them up. So, you know, <laughs> fast, you know, fast forward. Wow. And, um, you know, I'm starting to be really bothered by being in the house. Um, and my boyfriend, Adam, is noticing because I'm like, can you walk me to the bathroom? Will you stand outside the bathroom door? I need a snack. Will you go with me to get it? Like, and he was kind of like... After what happened the year prior, he was obviously like sensitive to that. So he was like, well, maybe she's just got some like PTSD or something. Sure. But also he's known me since we were 16. Um, we've been really good friends for a long time. So I think he was like, something's up with her, but I don't know what. Something's different here. And so one night we're laying in my bed and 
and I, it's October, uh, in Kent, it's cold, you know, oh, yeah. and, and, and Amber's a huge stickler for not putting the heat on until you have to. Yep. So, yep. So she's like, wear your hoodies, wear right. your layers, like until it is a must, the heat remains off kids. So my room was pretty chilly, but not like freezing, you know, you kind of get used to it, you know, in Ohio. And, um, I wake up and and I'm like, but I'm freezing. Like I wake up and I am like shivering and I'm sleeping in a hoodie. We got multiple layers, you know, Adam's in the bed. Like, but I am like, whoa, is it cold in here? And all of a sudden I hear the sound of my oscillating fan. Mm. And my fan, I had accidentally broke the year prior. It was one of those tall ones that kind of rotates side to side. And they have a distinct sound anyway, but mine had an extra distinct sound because when it went one direction too far, it made this weird clicking. So I could hear my fan on and I could feel it blowing back and forth across the bed. And I'm thinking, Adam, are you insane? It's already (laughs) so cold in here. Like, why do you have the fan on? So I like jab him and I'm like, Adam, Adam, I'm like... The fan's on, the fan's on. And he like kind of wakes up and he turns on the, the light next to my bed and the fan's not on. And he just looks at me and he's like, man, it's cold in here. And he's like, go back to sleep. The fan's not on. It's just cold. I'm like, okay. But I am now like on high alert, like, but the fan was on. Like I knew it was on. And I'm like, so I'm laying there. He lays down before he can fall back asleep. You hear my fan oscillating, the clicking, the going back and forth. And you can feel it. And he hops out of the bed, furious, turns on the light, goes stomping over across my room to the fan. And then he just freezes. Like, I will never forget this. He's walking super fast and he just stops. And it's just the back of him standing there. And he just bends down and turns around and just shows me the plug. Yep. Stop. It wasn't even plugged in. No. Yep. I was waiting for that. Yes. I love that. Damn. And it wasn't even plugged in. And the look on wow. his face, oh, it just gave me goosebumps now, Whoa. said it all. You and me both. Like, yeah. Not that it's an appropriate song for that setting, but it does make me think of, though, and then I saw his face. Now he's a believer. He's a believer. Like, he just saw 100%. that. 100%. Like, you, you know what happened? So like, that's like, the moment where, right. where Adam was like, whoa, this is something. Oh, or on was board. he still a bit skeptical? I'd say you're on after board. After that. So, you know, I'll go into another story with Adam. So he board. was, he, he was on board, but it was, it's what I can, it's interesting. So I've lived in a lot of haunted homes since I've had a lot of paranormal things happen. Like I said, I'm kind of tapped in, but I've never experienced this, which was, you almost knew not to talk about it. And so even though we both experienced that, neither one of us said anything. Mm. You and then knew one not night, to talk about it? It was like, don't, he just stood there holding it and we didn't talk about it. Like he showed it to me and we locked eyes and he shot me a look like this house is haunted. That was it. Right, right. right. But that was it. Not even, we had no talk. No no, debrief. No. And I think we went, he got back in bed and he like left the light on and we just like laid there. We didn't debrief. We didn't speak about, I don't know. It was really extra weird because I was like, but neither one of us wanted to say it like haunted ghost something oh like it was just wow. like let's you, not you don't want to believe it neither <laughs> one of you want to believe it and also if but you most, talk about it you might give it energy you know you exactly. might give it uh you might provoke it in some yeah. way or once you recognize that this is happening i've always heard that the that's when everything starts to elevate well it's the thing she said about being in the grocery store noticing somebody noticing your like somebody's eyes are on you when you look back at these sometimes or when you stare back at the darkness what stares back at you type that whole quote and that whole ethos you know yeah so you know it's crazy because then so i had been having this nightmare and this started on day one um i go into great detail in the podcast um but i'll sum it up quickly here but i started seeing a woman in my dreams and this is just so bizarre but um The stream was incredibly terrifying. I was suffering from sleep paralysis, both in the dream and when I woke up. And I would wake up from the dream. And when I would wake up, I'd have to shake myself out of sleep paralysis, which I've never really suffered from in my life at all before or since. And I'd wake myself up from this dream and I would go to go back to sleep and the dream would restart from the beginning. 
So for an entire year, I only had one dream that would re- re- literally, I would wake myself up, go back to sleep, and it would restart from the beginning of this woman in a white nightgown. And she looked just like that Samara girl from the ring. Exactly. So I'm having this nightmare. I haven't really talked with anybody about it. I really start to feel like I'm going crazy. And then one night, Adam goes downstairs to use the bathroom. And I remember hearing the sound of him coming up the stairs. He slams my door. He hops into bed and he is shaking and he literally throws the covers covers over his head. And he's like a, he's like a dude's dude, you know, like this is not in his nature. And he just says, I saw it. What? I saw it. So one night he went to go downstairs And when he turned the corner, there was this weird pillar in the house from the original foundation. They had added onto this house, but this pillar was still there. And when he turned the corner, he could see that someone was standing behind the pillar. And in his mind, he thought, okay, we got a couple options. One, somebody's playing a joke on us in the house. Doesn't feel like that. Two, it's a ghost. Nah, not that. Three, somebody broke in the house and I'm the only dude and I'm awake. And that person is standing really close to Amber's bedroom door. Oh God. Like, and he felt that feeling of, I got to fight somebody, right? (laughs) Like he's like, there's a crazy person in the house. You know, he said he could see that it was a woman with long, dark hair in a white nightgown. Oh boy. Oh, oh my God. There you go. Just standing behind the pillar. (sighs) My heart. So, (laughs) Dude, I got So he got... He got the guts to go for it. He's like, I'm going to tackle this person. Oh, so he, he went running. Oh, damn. And as he went running, it popped its head out from behind the pillar, opened its mouth, and roared at him. Whoa. Its whole face changed, and it opened its mouth and just roared like this demonic growl. Whoa. And he came upstairs, hopped in the bed. He goes, that's it. This house is haunted. I saw the ghost. I saw what? the ghost. He. He told me what it looked like, and that's exactly who I had been seeing in my dreams. And that's when I knew I was like, "Okay, this is this is happening." So it's let's you know. get out of here. So up until this point, that's you disturbing. guys were kind of all in denial. Maybe there's logic, even yourself. You you know, you said you're so yourself. Mm-hmm. You're tapped in, but you're still trying to make logical sense out of you know the canvases. But everybody's kind of in their own camp They're all in their own hell. The roommates. They're boyfriends with you. It's dividing them. It's dividing everyone. Well, the one never had the inclination for supernatural in general, Amber, right? But Rebecca and and Lindsay here, you know, everybody's getting separated out into these little islands now. Yeah, right. Yeah. Divide and conquer, demon style. (sighs) It's good. Yeah, this so I can amazing. tell you an, a, another. Yeah, so I can tell you another story that leads into another story that actually isn't in the show. That's super spooky. But um, so Amber's not believing now. My boyfriend Adam's on my side and understands. And um, you know, Amber and him were really close, and now she's noticing that he and I are both being really weird around the house, like like escorting each other around, like literally like, you know, like don't leave anyone alone, like watching each other's back so much. Like if somebody was doing something, like you would stand behind the other person and just kind of talk to them and stuff. Like you just had this feeling of like, we have to protect one another. Yeah. Yeah. And Amber still wasn't hearing it. We still weren't talking about it with her. It was clear she didn't want to. And I figured, look, whatever's in this house is after me the most. So why burden her if it's leaving her alone? I don't I don't need to do that anyway. But she was noticing some really radical changes in behavior, especially among Adam, who's this guy's guy, like tiptoeing around the house, holding hands with me. She's like, what are you two doing? <laughs> um and uh you know I love it that's funny as yeah well. <laughs> she's just like what so one day amber comes home to do her routine before going to work and she comes in the house she knows she's home alone nobody's there she cooks some food you know does what she's got to and she's heading out for work and she gets in her car and something says look up and she looks up and standing in the glass doorway is a woman in all white long dark hair and she says she looked for a moment and went what is Lindsay doing home and then she went wait Lindsay doesn't have hair like that 
And at the time, I remember her telling me, she said the thing lifted its head up really fast and the hair moved. And what was below looked like if someone took chalk on a chalkboard and just scraped off all the face. Mm. And Amber was so scared, she floored it in reverse and almost put her car into a ravine. Jesus. And so I get home and the phone will not... I come in the door like in a horror movie with the phone ringing and I pick it up and it's Amber and she's like, I saw it. Like... Oh shit. There's a, she's like there's a ghost in our house. Like Lindsay, I am so scared. Wow. I have and she said in that moment it was like the universe cracked for her because right. she went from be- believing in nothing right. to everything. Now everything is possible in the whole wide world. Wow. Cuz for her to go from believing in nothing now now it's all possible and her world got shook i mean so think at, about it yeah. you're agnostic or you know atheist and and you're all materialist science and there's no room for woo in your life you, you're going to work you're going to school this is this is reality this 3d world that's all there is you live you die and it's over bro talk about i mean it's like you know what can you compare it to smoking dmt for your first time no idea <sighs> I, I mean, I mean earth shattering kind of a situation. I'm trying to think of something that yeah, is so close to comparable. She to calls stop. you from her phone in the car and calls calls so, your cell or calls the house or So back then like cells were just becoming right. a more regular thing. Mm-hmm. She had one. She was calling the landline and she was actually at work oh, and gotcha. she was like in the back room. She worked at like Kohl's or something like yeah. that. And she was in some back room or maybe it was JC Penney's, whatever, but it was in Kent and she was in some back like changing room. Like just, she said she was in there supposed to be working, just calling the house on repeat. Mo- and also Man. to tell me there's a ghost in the house. Like she was scared for me. Like she was trying to warn me. There is something in our home. Like I need you to pick up the phone immediately. So she yeah. said she would not stop calling till somebody picked up. And so she's now in on it. And so did you tell her? Yeah, time, I know. Oh, so I know. Did you tell her, you know, I've yeah. been feeling this. This mm-hmm. is what I've been trying to tell everybody. Not like I told mm-hmm. you so, but kind of, yeah. I mean, how did you respond? Just like, Hey, it's cool. I know. Trying to comfort her. I, she basically said, I'm so sorry. Like yeah, I, wow. she knew I had tried to say things or do things and she was so dismissive that I stopped. And right. so she just said, I am so sorry, Lindsay, that yeah. I oh. like didn't hear you. And I said, dude, don't worry about it. But now you're in like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. take like yeah. a wrestling match. You're in, buddy. We just tagged you're in. Yeah. Wow. So uh, this leads into a crazy story that isn't in the podcast either, but, um, so at the time, ghost shows like we have now did not exist yet on TV. Um, maybe there were a couple that were on like, you know, like haunted this, but it wasn't like ghost adventures, ghost hunters, all those things. Not around yet, to my knowledge, at least. And we don't have the internet, or at least it isn't what it is now. So I'm trying to track down ghost groups and mediums and priests and trying to get people to come to the house and nobody will respond to me. And looking back, I do think the house actually did that. I think because if one thing I've learned about paranormal investigators, even back in the early 2000s, if somebody reaches out to you and is like, hey, I got a ghost, people are at your house in five minutes. Yeah, They're like, Willis, if you would have got a hold of him. Yeah. Yeah. Weird Willis would He'd probably been still go. Oh, yeah. 100%. He'd probably still want to. Right? Yeah. But I'm talking crickets. Nobody's getting back to me. So finally, I I come up with this idea. And I go, you know, I, and I love horror movies. I think I love horror movies. All of them. But I had actually never seen this one. But I remember my mother telling me about it. And it was the Amityville Horror, the mm-hmm. original. Yep. So I say to Amber and Adam, neither one of them have seen it. I said, let's rent this movie. It's supposed to be about a true haunting. I don't actually know much about it. But my mom always talked about it. And maybe we can like figure out some tips. Like, how do how, what do we do? Like, what do we do? So we put the movie on and things are starting to amp up. We're maybe 25 minutes into this movie. And out of nowhere, cool as a cat, Amber, who's now seen the ghost and Adam, who's also seen the ghost. Amber says, I think we need to shut it off. We we need to shut this off. And out of nowhere, my boyfriend starts going, we need to shut this off. We need to shut it off. We need to shut it off. Now, what I can explain to people is when it was starting to get ready to do stuff, 
the actual atmosphere of the house would change. You could actually feel the air around you altering. And the only way I could probably explain it to people, if you've ever been to like a, you know, uh, a festive haunted house, you know, where you walk through and people jump out and scare you in costumes. Sometimes you go to some and they have like an insane amount of like fake fog going. And it's so much fake fog that the air actually feels different than the outside air. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's not a real fog or anything, but it has a different atmosphere to it. In that house, it would be like that, except you're not seeing fog, by the way, but you're just you're feeling the actual air shifting and changing like almost electrically like you could feel it getting charged up you know and you could feel this negative you know very oppressive sensation rising so the movie is going people are screaming things are happening amber's now going shut it off adam go shut it off we can all in in that instant feel the house change and i go yeah yeah and then all of a sudden i look at the back porch and i go what's that this is so messed up And in the center of that glass sliding door on our porch, floating in the air, glowing, is this green, emerald green glowing ball of light. And I just go, what's that? And then they both look and they go, are you seeing this? And I go, yeah, I'm seeing this. And they go, what is that thing? I go, I I don't know. And the movie is getting louder and the feeling in the house is going up. And now we're seeing this glowing green thing. In the distance, and this creeps me out, you've seen it in movies like Evil Dead, I think, but I can see a fog forming, like fog. And where we are in Kent, you don't get fog, fog a whole lot. And it's on the ground and it's rolling slowly towards the back porch where this green light is. We're talking rolling slow (laughs) and it's thick and a few inches off the ground and the movie is getting louder and... And this fog comes rolling and just goes up the wooden back steps one by one by one, rolls across the porch and hits the glass door so hard that it actually makes an audible sound. Like if Mm. a a bug hits your windshield, that's how hard this fog hits the glass. It rolls up the glass and as it's rolling up the glass, it starts to pull into a mass. And now we have this fog becoming a mass being illuminated by this green light. Okay. So now it's like glowing. It starts to pull in and all everyone says is run. Jeez. We run out We run out of the front door. We leave the TV on or maybe one of us hit it as we went out. We might've hit it as we ran, but didn't lock the door, left. And we all went and crashed at Adam's crummy little apartment, which we would do when the activity was really bad. And the next day we came back and we said... There's no explanation for what we saw, but let's try to disprove this. We got to debunk this somehow. Please let there be an, a, a reason for this. And my one theory was, you know, at the holidays, sometimes people are cheap with ho- uh, holiday decorations and they'll screw in like a green light bulb or something. And I was like, maybe somebody's got a gr- green light bulb out there somewhere. So we're snooping through everyone's yards. And of course, no green light bulb. Um, and we just knew what we saw was what we saw. And, and the, the lesson learned was a few things we learned about this house. We never watched a horror movie of any kind in that house ever again because it obviously gave it something to do whatever it was whatever it was going to do i have no clue but it was building towards something Dude. and then this or sorry and the second rule was to never talk about the entity in the house mm. ever again why because you're acknowledging it and that gives it power i was wondering watching the movie if that was like one, you're watching that. It's, you know, you guys are all aware of it at this story. point. It's charging you up. It's giving this, like, literal energy charge, like fear, mm-hmm. right? That charges us up. Whether whether it's fear or excitement, that dopamine and, 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 and uh, uh, what do I want to say here? Just run. Uh, adrenaline, yep. right? Yep. It still mm-hmm. comes out. So that charge is out there. So that energy, like... Yeah, it's probably good. I would say it was a good uh, set of rules, like no more movies. And so you didn't talk about it, but if you didn't talk about it, what if, what if things happened? To, you had to talk to each other about it to, to, to make now. sure, you know, are we yeah. still like. And does Rebecca eventually get brought into the loop? 
And do you guys start well, working together? <laughs> or, I mean, I, I, I want to listen. I'm going to listen to the entire oh, series. Oh, 100%. It's, you got like, me sold, sold, There's sold. detail. And I don't know if you want to talk just I'm gonna tell everybody a little bit this. about some of the folks that you, you got a hold of or interviewed and mm-hmm. spoke to in the creation of this. But you, you consulted with a lot of people to really try to understand yeah. what this was. Yeah. And one of the things we did too was, so we, we, we learned not to talk about it in the house. And so what it was is if you had something really bad paranormal happen, or you felt the vibe was up in the house, we would all go debrief at like our favorite local bars in Kent. So me, Adam and Amber would literally go to the bars and then sit down and go, okay, let's talk what right. happened. But not at the, the person house. would say, but not at the house. Yeah. The other rule as well, which I forgot to include, which was number three, which is no one was allowed in the house alone, especially mm-hmm. after dark. So if you got home from classes or work or wherever, you would wait in your car <laughs> till someone came home. So you would sit in your car with your little car laid on, like doing homework or just waiting. And when someone pulled in, you would go in together because we learned that whatever was in that house, I mean, its capabilities were beyond comprehension. And it, what if you were there alone? What if it did something to you? Like, you just couldn't be alone. No one slept alone. Um, nobody was in the house alone for us. Now shift to Rebecca, still ain't coming out of her room. And then one day, enough's enough. And she's moving out. And this would be, I want to say pretty early, only a couple months in, maybe two, three months in. And my best friend, Lane, my all-time best friend, much how you two are, this is my all-time best friend, Lane, is coming back to finish her degree. And so it just so happens as Reba's moving out, Lane's going to come back to school. And I'm like, hell yes. I'm like, because if anybody on this planet could make the vibes in this house better, it's Lane. Lane's a little tapped in too. She's my best friend, great sense of humor. She's the life of the party. Everyone loves Lane. And so great energy coming in this house. And I even warned her, you know, I said, dude, like there's stuff going on in this house, like paranormal, crazy stuff. And she goes, that's fine. Like I'm used to it. Like I can deal with it. I'm like, cool. Great. All right. Lane. Yeah. So all's well. Lane moves into that room. She shuts the door and she never comes out. Oh, damn. Shut up. What? Shut up. Wow. Never comes out. Yeah. And in her case, so in Reba's Reba's case, Reba openly basically says what was in the house influenced her mind and kept her in the room. In Mm -hmm. Lane's case, this guy she was dating, and and I didn't put this in the podcast because at the time it was too sensitive, um, just emotionally for Lane, but now now we talk about it. It's fine. But um, Lane had a boyfriend who was not a good guy, but not the worst. She said when he got into that house with her, he became evil. And she said something switched in him and he wouldn't let her leave the room. So in 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 Reba's case, the whatever was in the house influenced her to stay mm. in the room. In Lane's case, whatever was in the house influenced her boyfriend to keep her in the room. Wow. And year and she said the house changed him and made him evil. During the making of the podcast, I get a call from Lane and she is crying and she goes, It happened. I told you that house did something to him. He was never good, but that house did something. He just got arrested for murder, a brutal cool. homicide. Yeah. He's in he's in prison for life. And he and and he almost tried to kill her a couple times, I guess, in that room. And he eventually, wow, this guy dude. went on to kill somebody. Yeah. This is serious business. I mean, you're talking uh, not just a haunted house. We're talking about ramifications of this house years into the future. Wow. Absolutely. I've never heard anything like that before. I say you got my full wild. attention. I'm, I'm I'm blown away. That like, is wild. And and it, of course, and it was just crazy to me as I'm making this podcast that I get the call that this guy that's when Dang. he finally murders murders someone is while I'm actually making the show. And like Lane said, whatever was in the house got into him and it was not him anymore and Damn. it was not good. But So then, yeah. So when I started making the show, I just thought, well, you know, I have a lot of people in my life, funny enough, that are non-believers and skeptics. And, and I get that, you know, um, 
And I thought, well, if I'm going to do this story, I've got to do it right. And I I have to remove my bias of what I think happened and what I think I know happened and talk to professionals and yeah. just hear them, them out, you know, collect all the eyewitness testimony from everyone I can who's been in this house, but also talk to professionals. So, you know, I got Lloyd Arabach on there. He's like a really well-known parapsychologist. Uh, Michael, uh, Michael Salerno, who's a demonologist. I got um, psychologists, neurologists, um, folklore. I spoke to everyone I could under the sun to try to better understand what was going on. And if it wasn't a haunting, okay, give me some ideas of what else could be going on here. Right. And so speaking with all these people, though, you know, even the psychologist said, look, some of what you're saying sounds like it could be mold toxicity, mm. but which makes sense. But the other things you're talking about, I mean, hearing a psychologist say this to me, she goes, the other things you're talking about, that's not possible. Like for multiple people to be experiencing these same things. She goes, I don't know that there's anything else other that, than to say that your house was haunted. Like you had a ghost, like it is what it is, right. you know? Wow. And <clears throat> do you think the, whatever the entity was, do you think it stayed there? Do you think it followed um, your girl's boyfriend and and has been with him or i mean is the the house Attached still there him, yeah i mean the guy that did was it, convicted right because sometimes those they can move on from what i understand you know i'm no expert but i've heard a lot of stories and documented um you know eyewitness testimony that's corroborated by police officers showing up multiple times because you know, there's something always happening to these people. Mm. They're always getting hurt or, you know, there's always a domestic disturbance where the husband just turns dark and then starts beating his wife. And then yeah. eventually, so, you know, the, uh, these cases are documented pretty well. Um, this has elements, though, that, that are similar to other things that I've heard about, but very, very, very unique it's an extreme in, case. Right. This is wild. I dude. just want to know. I'm speechless. And I don't... I, Stop me if I start putting the horse before the cart or whatever. Cart before the horse. I don't even know how to say that. <laughs> the house. Yes. I'm still interested in this house in general of the symbol, the old, the nature of the basement. That is symbol it still holds there? Do something people there? still inhabit it? Do people still live there? It's still rented yeah, out? Yeah, so... <laughs> okay. The last resident, without giving too much away... That yeah, sure, sure. There, Don't dox he, him, yeah. He his him and his roommates lived there about two years ago, and it's still haunted. Yeah. Wow. And what what I can say is what I figured out by the end of all of this, all the people I spoke to, everything I put together, everything I experienced in the home. What I can tell you is that it was a demon. Um, and here's what's really weird, as because again, I've had a lot of paranormal experiences and I don't say demon lightly. I think in, in everyone wants it to be a demon these days. Like on TV shows and movies, we all want the demon because it's like so much scarier. But mm. in reality, when, you, when you've when you had so many haunting things happen as I have, so many paranormal experiences, you realize it isn't a demon. But I can see how, if you're not used to it, how easily startling it is if a door opens, if something falls off a shelf. Right. You know it's a demon when it is affecting people and changing their personalities. Yep. When it can move objects, large objects, many times around the house. When it's affecting your dreams nonstop. And what's really crazy is... So what I learned with speaking with demonologist Michael Salerno is that demons are... They're smart. They've been here before we were. They'll be here long after humans are gone. Like they're beyond our comprehension. We try to, you know, t have a sense of what they are, but who really knows, you know? Yeah. But at the end of the day, they have been doing, they've been here a long time and they're smart and they, they don't waste their time, you know? Like, you can imagine, like, it's almost like there's, he's just a demon kicking in the basement, picking his teeth and just wait, listening to people move in and going boring, boring, and then going, oh, this will be a fun one I'm coming out for, you know, like they don't waste their time. And one of the things that I realized was the manipulation, the intelligence, knowing how to scare people. It's one thing to be startled. And that's the difference. Spirits and human spirits will startle you. They will startle you. They might move something or you might hear them. That's startling. If you hear a voice and you can't see a person, that's startling. But that's not intentionally scary. A demon will do things to scare you literally. And, you know, it would do things all the time. And, and one of the weird things was... 
the way that I saw it, it looked like the girl from the ring. The way Amber saw it, it looked like the girl from the ring. The way Adam saw it, it looked like the girl from the ring. And spoiler alert, Lane saw it as well. It looked like the girl from the ring. And here's the thing. The movie The Ring had just come out around this time, I believe. And all of us equally, even Amber, who was never afraid of anything, was actually scared of this movie. And it literally chose its form. Like in Ghostbusters, like choose the form of your destructor. It literally looked into all of our minds and went, everyone's so scared of this character. Mm. I'm going to wear it like a costume. Because other people who have lived there since, what they have seen is just a straight up demon. And so what was there... What was there was literally wearing a costume to make itself extra scary. Yep. So yeah, just that's so scary. It makes me think of Stephen King's It. But the same thing of you know exactly. manifest Adam your fear. Saw the closest to what it actually was when it it opened its mouth and growled at him when he tried to tackle it. That, I mean, dude, you know, that's trying like to taking the, that's, that's kind of taking the mask off. That uh, you know you'll hear stories about people. You know, I've, I've talked about it before, but like scratching in the walls and. And kind of this low growling and inside walls or in the ceiling. Yeah, I've not or, had that. Um, you know, the growling thing is, is definitely typical for sure. You know, you hear. Not had that. I'm good without that. No. I'm good. <laughs> I had a cat scratching this weekend. I'm not going to lie. My wife's uh, parents' house up in, in uh, Painesville has got some weirdness to it over the years. Like some purported and seen hauntings from their family. But. So we're laying there and I'm like sleeping. I wake up out of a dead sleep because I hear the scratch. I'm like, oh my God, it's happening. It's happening again. (laughs) And thank God it was just the cat, Charlie, (laughs) that her parents have now brought to the house. But like, I'm not kidding when I woke her up because I have woken up in that house and I have had those moments where I'm like, oh, it's this or it's that. And then I'm like, it's not this or that. And I don't know what the hell that is, but I don't want it anymore. And I'm like, you know, but it startled. your chest starts tightening, your heart starts pounding. Like you feel your body yeah. starts kicking up. That's what I'm saying about the energy creation of even watching, you know, the the horror movie and, and bringing that amount of power and energy to that house. Like, and also the kind of energy that might be harnessed by something like that, that fearful energy, like, uh, Feeds on it. Joel, That's what sure, it sounds like. Sure. You know, oh, with, with uh, Reba. 100%. And for sure, with Reba, just feeding off of that fear. like and paranoia. And adding that seed of doubt about your friends. And they're after me. They're making fun oh of me. Oh, my gosh. They're, you know, they're in, on the other side of the door whispering behind my back. I mean, That's it sounds wild, funny, but if I was dude. living in that house, I'd, I'd have the same reaction. If I, if, because yeah. I have sensitive hearing. If I heard all that and I walk out and I don't see it, like. I would have a problem with all of that. Yeah. I mean, these leases yeah, and have it, to be short leases for these renters. <laughs> Jesus. Nobody I would imagine. And and it's so crazy, too, because like you're saying, like the other things it would do is like affecting people. Like this yeah. is a really freaky thing. And I kind of talk about it in the show a little, but I don't go into it a ton. But like Amber would come home sometimes and walk up the back stairs on this porch, open the sliding door, slam it, stomping her feet like livid go into her room, slam the door. You would hear her in her bedroom, like banging around stuff. Now, Amber is like a really calm, passive person, by the way. So imagine seeing someone coming in the house, like they've lost their temper Mm -hmm. completely, going into their room. You could hear her talking in there sometimes, just slamming stuff around. And then it would go quiet and she would come out and she'd go, hey guys, how's it going? And you would go, good, how's it going with you? You just freaked freaked out. (laughs) And she'd be like, fine. And this always really freaks me out. So there were times she'd come out after that just smiling. And she would sit on the couch with me. And she would look over at me smiling and then look back at the TV. And I would go, was the person who just came in the house angry, Amber? And is this the demon? She's like slightly possessed. In my friend sitting next to me now, or was it the demon influencing her? And this is my friend. Like, I wouldn't know what was sitting next Mm, to me. And I'd have this feeling. And we all talked about, you would get a sensation of feeling jumped. I felt it a few times where you would have time gone. You'd lose time Mm. in the house. You'd lose time. Uh, Wow. Wow. Where it's basically just puppeteering anybody in the house. Right. It's a good way to put it. And you would, yeah. And puppeteering and you would lose time. And when you ask Amber about those moments, both then and now, she has no memory of them. She has no memory of coming in the house. She would, there would be times, <clears throat> I kid you not, 
where I'd be sitting next to her with her just looking at the TV smiling. And she'd kind of look at you and go, when did I get here? Like, mm. she'd almost have a, I don't know when I, I don't remember getting here. Like, and I remember times that I would all of a sudden kind of come to and everyone would be looking at me and I wouldn't remember what I said, how long I had been talking, what I came out of my mouth. And usually it would be people losing their tempers, like becoming really violent or volatile with their words and acting the way Amber did. Except no. e every time it happened to any of us, we have no memory of doing it. Yeah. Ever. So the demon's like, I got to peace out before I get this uh, host like wrecked by the uh, other yeah. inhabitants of the house. But I've had my fun, yeah. and I'm yeah, going to dip out I of mean, here. I, I've wrecked their psyches enough. They won't sleep tonight. Wow. Well, Jesus. Exactly. That, that symbol, that ancient symbol, and I, 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 even if you could draw it, I don't want to see it. <laughs> Seriously, because I just... Yeah. I believe you. I don't need I to... You. I, I believe you. I'm fully a believer. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good on and the doorways that I don't need to open. And I know those symbols can hold portals open. Yep. Can, you know, bring that manifest of whatever that specific sigil is... I mean, you yeah, know, I'm good. I've I've heard a few demonologists, uh, lots of demonologists, talk at conferences where they go through it's intriguing the different names and um, you know, and like part of it, of banishing these things is is getting it to say its name and yeah. to you know, essentially because like she said, it's a trickster, it's hiding behind this veil of the ring character, um, and sure. then getting it to show its true self. So there's like some of these ways that you know the Catholic Church has had. Um, but, but also, um, you know, branches of Christianity, whether it's voodoo, there's a lot of different South Americans have a lot of rituals on how to get rid of these things. Um, but it's every culture has You're talking about exorcism? an exorcist in indigenous cultures, whether it's the shaman well, purging of a negative energy, if you will, let's well, we call it exorcism, but getting out whatever's in someone. That yeah. you don't want in but there. there's not many ways to do it. I mean, like I said, the Catholic Church um, uh, makes me think of the movie Constantine the, uh, when they're pulling like, demons out of the the girl into the mirror. Yeah, Jesus, into the mirror. I love that movie. That opening yeah. scene is so wicked. Constantine's was way move ahead the of its car. <laughs> oh yeah, it's move the car, Chaz. Move the car. Such a good movie. <laughs> it's, it is. I need to rewatch that. A great. Constantine's film. dope. Great film. Um. Wow. I Talks think they're making a, a second one, by the way. That would be Shut incredible. Up. Really? That would be so awesome. So, so I guess it's Keanu Reeves' favorite role he ever played was John Constantine. And so he's been basically petitioning forever and nobody would give it to him because like you said it was ahead of its time not all the people got it like yeah, right. now it's like a cult, it's a cult hit now yeah. um but with, with with how good he's done with john wick they basically said you can make anything you want right. he said constantine too so they're making constant yes I think. yes that's, amazing. that's yeah. oh my god that's amazing I'm so yeah. pumped about that. Thank you for that bit of news. Yeah, we need to. Yeah, unless it's some fakers on the internet. If hey. they are, like, I will find you and well, I will hunt you down. Yeah. This, is already, this, this is already. This is the butterfly effect. You heard it. Yeah, this is the butterfly <laughs> effect, though. You already said it. We spoke it into existence. It's, it's coming. It's, it's on the breeze. Yeah. From what I read, it is a real thing. So. I love it. That and Beetlejuice, too. I'm, I'm complete. Oh, I'm excited for that, too. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. This is going to be. It's going to be. I'm going to be scared for the next week listening to this story unfold. Oh, I'm going to put this it on full tonight. story. Yeah, I don't know if I can listen to it. Oh, I'm, I'm already my getting... wife out with it for sure. <sighs> well, yeah. it's funny. What I did was too. I peppered it with a lot of folklore and urban legends, which I love anyway. Yeah, because. Mm -hmm. I realize there's parts of this that are so scary that if you just did it back to back, I think it would almost be overkill. Like I, I've had, I, so truth be told, here's some crazy things. I've had people accidentally drive their car off a road listening to the show. They weren't expecting something and literally drove their car off a road. I've had people listening in their little, you know, beats or whatever in grocery stores accidentally scream out in the grocery store. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh man, I would yeah. love to see that. That's I would great. love to. So, have been there. <laughs> but but for the most part, everyone says the th same thing, which is like thanks for like spacing things out in a way that yeah. like when the really scary things happen, you talk about other things before and after to give me a mental break because it's just too much otherwise, Definitely. you know. And I've had a lot of people. Yeah, and I've had a lot of people experience paranormal activity while listening, so I always tell people, listeners, be warned. Um, 
people that are reliable too. Like, I, I mean, whoever's listening, I don't know. They could just be really excited or enthusiastic. I don't know them well enough to vouch for them. But people I know that I can vouch for who are not a necessarily a fan. I had one friend in particular have to tell me she got through episode three and stuff started moving in her house. Mm-hmm. And she said, I, I, I love you, but I'm not listening anymore. She goes, yeah. something is being triggered in my house because she was like listening to it, like a, like on something out loud. And she goes, it's just not worth it for me. And another I person believe- has like a, yeah, has a beaded curtain, same thing that she was listening and she saw something kind of take a finger and move her beaded curtain and she went, I'm all set. So I think yeah. like if you have entities in your home, I don't think it's my entity, but I can't say, but I think if they feel like you're saying the energy, I think if yeah. it's hearing it and feeling it, it can cause a reaction. So I warn people like, just be cautious. If you think your house is haunted, don't listen to my podcast there, I guess. I'm going to burn some sage, make a little alt, you know. The experiment in my brain Get that my just cooked up was like, how do we make, Michael how do we make these batteries or some kind of like these devices that could generate whatever the energy frequency waves are that humans generate when they're afraid? What is that essence? What's that okay. vibe? What's that like, wave? Like the Skeksis. And then you could go into houses and be like, is this place haunted? Like, we're going to charge it up. We're going to see if it draws yeah. anything. Like if rolling up fog just hut, you know comes up oh, and knocks on the door with a green was light like nuts i'm going to be freaked out for a while the yeah green dark green light that seems like a portal to me whatever I'm, that was i'm stoked it's like a portal opening or mike something. always jokes that i come into these shows and that i don't really know that much because it's pretty true like i, like I do i do jump in into these blind because that's probably better for me though that <laughs> i is. don't have more questions yeah. <laughs> i already have enough questions and i know very little coming in but like um how over all of the time of you go through living in it, digesting it, I'm going to make this podcast finally because I don't know what else to do with it. Great what's choice. that What's that like through all that time to finally be able to get to put it into oh, action, though, and be able to sit back yourself, too, and have all the vantage points? And really, instead of like in the moment being like, well, this is how I remember, like having the whole thing to review. Does that feel good for you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, cause I think for me, it was like, all right, it sounds so messed up. You know, these things happened. Like, you know that they did, but something in you, like with all traumatic things in life, you kind of put them on a shelf. Like sure. they're there, but they're not with you 24 seven affecting you. But then hearing Adam talk about it, Amber talk about it, Reba talk about it, Lane talk about it, the other residents I found who lived in the home. I found over 26 people who experienced paranormal activity. Wow. Um, you go, oh my God, this happened. So you have this wonderful like release and validation to go. I knew this all happened, but like I almost doubted myself because some of it seems so unreal that you're just like, how is this real? And I've had so many paranormal experiences. I know it's real, but when you hear everybody tell it and talk about it, you just go, wow. And then it's also been a really great channel for other people because it's also about like, what do you do when you live in a haunting and nobody believes you know, a haunted house and nobody believes you. What do you do when you feel like you're on your own? What do you sure. do when you live with a, de- a demon? Like, I I just know that for some people listening, it, it makes them, I get a lot of people writing saying, thank you for sharing it all because it makes me feel better about what happened to me when I was eight or makes me feel better about what happened to me in my thirties. Like, you know, because you feel kind of nuts. So it was so great to get it out into the world. Also to hopefully help people has always been my goal and it seems like it has. So that's a good thing. That's amazing. Great. That's amazing. I I think that's spot on. That's that's amazing. Yeah. Sometimes things happen in our lives where it completely it shapes you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you know, sometimes I'm sure you feel like you went through it and it sucked, but look what came out of it. And you know, you're fortunate to yeah. you know create the podcast and the platform to share your story. And I'm sure it's probably therapy for some of your roommates and. And Adam to to hopefully you know bring this back up and process yeah. it all these years later. Have you felt like a a release or a weight off your shoulders in any in that regard? Yeah, it's so I have an episode called Epilogue, and it's not it's like sidebar of the show, but what's really weird. So I, there was a huge release now that it's all done, especially because so one thing that demonologist Michael Salerno warned me when I, he was the first person I really talked to, by the way, while making this show. And he said something to the effect of, you do know that they don't like being talked about, right? Like demons, like, you know, this, right. right. And I'm sitting there thinking, uh, no, yeah. Oh, okay. Like, what do you mean? And he goes, 
they kind of operate like the mafia. And what makes the mafia so effective is no one talks about the mafia, right? Everything they do is kind of under the ground. They operate, they commit what they need to, they get everything done, but they do it kind of in the shadows. When you talk about these things, it's much like a news reporter that reports on a mafia guy and ends up murdered laying in a ditch, right? Yeah. Like they don't want you to talk about it. So anybody who's putting it out, they will try to silence you. And he gave me this warning and he was like, you know, the target's coming back on your back and I just need you to be aware of this. And mm. I remembered thinking he's a demonologist. I believe in this stuff and I believe him, but like really day one of recording my first episode, the narrated script, I get out of the, I did the narration. I get out of the shower. I'm all jazzed up, man. I did my first day and I look down at my thigh and I have a huge bite mark on my thigh. What? I didn't feel it. I didn't see it. It looked like it had been there for weeks. It was faint, crooked teeth. It stayed for probably a month. It never changed. My husband came home. I said, Adam, look at my thigh. He goes, who bit you? He's like, that's a big bite. And I go, "Did you take no one. I did. And it's hard because in the photo, you can see it, but it's faint, but it's there. And it stayed, like I said, for for a month like this, like this Mm -hmm. faint, weird, crookedy toothed bite mark. Day one. Toothed. Crookedy tooth. And I sent it to Michael (laughs) and I said, do you see a bite marker in my nuts? Because I was like, because my husband wasn't around when this happened. And I sent it to Michael first and he got back to me immediately. He goes, that's a bite mark. And he goes, and that's more like what we really see in our world in the movies they show it to you as this clear bloody thing it doesn't look like that right because they're affecting you if you think about it with energy kind of from the inside out in a way it's energy right they're not they don't have teeth how can they bite you think about that so in movies they exaggerate these bites by making them bloody or big like in conjuring 2 when she gets bit when i send him the photo he goes it's faint but in my line of work that's what they look like that's a bite mark and throughout the making of the entire podcast poor adam uh, my poor husband we had so many crazy things happening paranormal wise you hear about some of them in in episode uh, 14 the epilogue but It was insane and it was actually kind of scary. And then once I finished it all, it stopped. And Mm. I was like, thank God it's done. Cause you were talking about him. I got one question I have to ask before I forget. Do you know of anybody when you were doing the podcast and getting all the historical information on tenants house? Was there ever a single tenant? Anybody that rented that place by themselves? Alone. Yeah, any Kevin no. McAllisters of the of the haunted house? No, no, not that I know of. Maybe that was a um, stipulation they wouldn't let somebody rent it by so. themselves. Yeah, yeah. I, from what I understood, it was always college kids or families um, for the most part. So yeah. it sounded like every time it was rented. And what I did learn over the course of talking to and and research, you know, reaching out to so many people who lived in this home. What's interesting is that it's like the the haunting, I always say it varied from mild, medium to spicy. And when, again, I spoke with Michael uh, Salerno, he kind of explained it like, again, like demons don't waste their time, quite frankly. Like if they've got nothing to get from you or there's nothing to gain or you're not any fun for them, yeah. like they just stay dormant because what's mm, the point, Right. you know? And if you're someone that they really think they can mess with, um, they will come out to play. So it makes sense to me hearing because everyone who lived there experienced something. It's just some of us at different times experienced the worst of the worst. And I think that it really lines up with what Michael explained, which it's just, it depends on the people. If you're more sensitive, if you're going through life trauma, whatever it can feed on, Mm -hmm. it's coming out for you. And if you're really closed off, it might not come out at all. Or if it does, it'll be very minor stuff. Enough for you to know the place is haunted for sure, but not like pulling things off of walls or, you know, popping into people's nightmares. But the demon is basically like Vince Vaughn or Owen Wilson from Wedding Crashers or even Will Ferrell's character who ends up going up to funerals finally and crashing funerals. Like, you know, the (laughs) strongest natural aphrodisiac is grief, right? But it might also be a very strong motivator for the paranormal activity. So, you know, this demon's like, hey, I see somebody there. Like you're saying to your analogy of that's my ride. That's my ticket. That's my, you know. Everything that she went through the year before. Traumatic. Anxiety, oh yeah, you were charged, traumatized. To the max. Like you were an easy target, and you like your a friends giant were helping you. Battery so you in guys were house. exactly, but the, your friends were feeding into it. They were kind of your protectors. Yeah. So it was a good uh, 
I guess you could say a challenge. Yeah. And, and what I always, and Michael said the same thing and what I, what I, yeah, what I experienced the year prior, what I always felt was it knew about all of that somehow. And Michael said that they do. And it mimicked a lot of my abuser's behaviors. And and I, and, and I felt stalked throughout the house once again, you know, like when I felt, yeah, it mimicked a lot of those feelings that I used to feel like even feeling the knees on the bed and thinking he was in the room, like a person was there. Right. It was. And, and so I went from a human stalking to a literal demonic stalking and it, totally preyed upon that wow. and then also wow. putting my best my best friend through an incredibly abusive relationship while in the house in that room it was a further torture for me because i knew something was going on with her and this guy and she refused to talk about it or say anything and she wouldn't come out of the room but i knew That's just and i just knew Jesus. instinctively what happened to me last year is now happening to my best friend lane but i can't get her out of the room and she won't talk to me and he's going to hurt her and he was doing exactly to her what my abuser had done to me which was just crazy what are the odds right so clearly what was in the house used everything it had to its you know, and and at the end of the day, I mean, I think these things, when people ask me, well, what do you know the difference between a, a ghost or a demon? Ghosts might be grumpy. Like if uh, some dude's an old grumpy, you know, that grumpy neighbor everybody has in their neighborhood, you know, if he dies and becomes a, a ghost, he's still a grump. It's not like he's, if he sticks around, he's going to be some pleasant guy. So yeah, he might slam stuff around. He might move furniture. You know, you he might be grumpy, but that's grumpy. A demon wants you to hurt yourself, to kill yourself, to kill other people, right. to not not sleep, to you know suddenly change your moods and your habits and your your personality, and it's an attack that is just relentless. It just doesn't stop, and so that's a big difference, and that's what we were all experiencing in that house. Damn. Now, has the house ever been properly investigated by a paranormal research group? Or have has anyone through the podcast reached out and been like, hey, I got this, you know, I would love my to know. goal. Yeah, my goal, which is sounds crazy to people, but it, not anymore for me after everything I've gone through and where I'm at with kind of my quote unquote abilities and things. My dream goal would be to go back to the house oh, and God. bring a team because I know that if I go there, I know it's still there. I have at the, towards the end of the show, I I go back and it's there. It's still there. I could tell. And I know that if I went into the house, if Adam went into the house, if maybe even Amber popped by, you know, I've got other people that would, who have lived there that had experiences that might be willing to come, that our energy would certainly bring it out. And I think if we had a team there to investigate and we were there long enough, I mean, it would probably be groundbreaking. I think the things that we could get with modern technology of of investigating would be mind blowing and then i'd love to finish the whole thing by bringing in someone like michael salerno or yeah. some sort of demonologist to cleanse the place and get that thing out of there yeah because Amazing. my biggest yeah and my biggest fear honestly is someday someone is going to hurt somebody for real like mm-hmm. kill someone or somebody's going to take their own life in that house it's only a matter of time and I, and again, the haunting varies in its, its intensity, but it's like, it just takes the right time, the right group, mm-hmm. the right person. And I'm so scared of what will happen if somebody doesn't appropriately investigate and get this thing out of there. So that's my dream goal. And I have had a few people talk about, we should do a documentary, we should do a TV show. And, you know, those things take a while to bring together, mm-hmm. but I'm, I'm, I'm open for it. And I hope it happens from my knowledge. I don't think anyone's investigated. I hope no one ever mm-hmm. does. I never disclose where it's at because yeah. what is there wants the attention. For sure. And if you, and if you don't know what you're doing with this thing, man, good luck. Cause it will only make it stronger. It will not go well. Well, I will say we can get you in contact with our friend James A. Willis. He's an Ohio guy, um, you know, 20 plus years, if not 30 years of, um, you know, legit paranormal investigator. And uh, he very by the book yeah, likes to um, and is to. not afraid to nope. dive in as deep as he needs to go um, and has the gear, has the equipment. Um, you know, he, he might be 
um, you know, hooking up with some people we know that, that have a property in, uh, near Serpent Mound um, mm. that's got a lot of weird kind of doppelganger portal activity, haunting uh, the Dollar General across the street. Um, so we're trying to hook up James with with uh, some of our friends as well. But, uh, you know, let's stay in contact because I think, you know, from what I understand, uh, this uh, uh, proper investigation, I think, would be incredible. And like you said, with uh, having multidisciplinary and uh, of different people, the demonologist, you know, someone that's sensitive like yourself, someone like James coming in with the, the investigative mm-hmm. background. Um, I might have to tap out, though. I don't think I'm going in. <laughs> I don't think I'm going in. I, I'm not built for that game yet. I don't think I have the. I don't think I have the armor for that yet, or the ability. Like, I think I would be one of those people where that demon would be like, oh, I'm going to have a field day with that guy. <laughs> like, you my know, like, imagination's <laughs> way too active already. Like, oh, boy. yeah. Nobody would believe me. They'd be like, oh, you're not seeing a demon. That's just Bub being crazy. Like, he's just, he's an imaginative person. So, like, that would be, that would be bad for me. Yeah. Well, and that's what I always say to people because I have a lot of listeners reach out that want to know where the house is. And I'm like, I'm yeah, never you telling you. you know, because what's there. If people start, you know, digging up the grass and taking it home and peeking in the windows and knocking, saying, can I come in? Like, what is there is literally like we were talking about energy going to feed off that like a battery. And for me, if if you're going to do this thing, I would love to work with like a TV show or a documentary crew and go in and document this, like whether it's for a couple of weeks, like go live there. I mean, it sounds crazy. And then get rid of it. And then that way, like if people want to drive by it in the future and they're like, that's the house from the thing, as long as it's not there anymore, I don't care. But as long as I know what's there is capable of physically and mentally hurting people. That's a problem. It is. That's a problem. That's a huge problem. So, you know, I get people requesting all the time, including investigators. They're like, I want to go. And I'm like, I will never tell you where this is because until it can be done properly, like and gotten rid of, it's just not worth it to, because someone might be living there and not dealing with the level that we were. And then, People start peeking in the windows and all of a sudden, like, they've got, like, stuff flying off the walls and they're like, what's happening in our home? Mm -hmm. So there's no reason to give it more power at all. Do you know about the current property owners? It's not the same two weird gentlemen from the 2000s, so. I spoke to the current landlord, actually. Yeah, yeah. And he, actually, I was really nervous. It was like the last call I really made before I started putting the show together and I gotten his information and the house had recently changed hands. And I thought this, and he's like a younger guy. I thought he's going to laugh me off the freaking phone when I tell him this stuff. But in my head, I was like, if someone ever comes to him and says, is there something going on in this house? And he's already heard it once before he might believe someone right? right. Rather than dismissing them. And maybe these guys didn't tell him that that mm-hmm. house is haunted or who knows what they said or didn't say. I don't know. Um, he didn't laugh me off the phone, but here's what's weird. I said, do you know if the graffiti is still in the basement, the symbol? And he went, what are you talking about? And I said, well, like the symbol in the basement, the big one, like, is it there? And he's like, there's no symbol in the basement. I go, have you been in the basement? And he goes, well, yeah, I own the house. Of course I have. I said, you haven't seen the symbol. No. The the guys that were renting from him, the symbol's still there. Hmm. So he's saying, I have no idea what you're talking about. It's still there. So I also have a theory that whatever's in the house is either fueled by this symbol or was brought here by that symbol. Of course. And I... And I think that the way I felt and other people I've spoken to, nobody has a different feeling about this symbol. No one's looked and been like, oh, that's nothing. Every single person I've talked to who's seen it has said devil stuff, occult stuff, made me Mm -hmm. sick, made me feel unwell. I couldn't be around it. I don't know if the landlords cannot see it, like literally. Or... Or if they don't want to touch it. Like, we never took photos of it because we were too scared to. And anyone else I spoke to said I was too scared to ever take a photo of it. I wouldn't. You had it. 
Really? I personally would not have ever taken a photo of I'm it. just saying the resounding, though. I mean, so many people are like, oh, screw it. I'll take a picture of that. I or mean, I'll. When you first so explained many it, people play it off. When she first said the symbol in the graffiti. It sounds like black speech Instantly, from, you know, I was Mordor. like, oh, boy. I know where this is going. This is going into demonic haunting territory. Well, and I get it, too. It's not like something you're going to see at Hobby Lobby or like Hobby Lobby or like Michael's of like, you know, this made up crafty. Mm -hmm. like, I get what you're saying. It literally is like something that is almost like it doesn't seem like it's a created symbol from a person. It seems like it's so a created ancient. symbol from like something in the energy of this universe that is like, yeah, it's just a war. It's like seeing a porcupine, like do not touch, like. You yeah. can see this and you're like, that just doesn't, it doesn't make me feel warm and fuzzy. The last guys that lived in the house, I asked them about the symbol. I, it, I didn't have to. That was one of the first things he brought up, by the way. Him and his roommates, a bunch of guys, guys, college dudes were completely made to feel terrified and uncomfortable by this symbol. They spent more time researching it than oh. I can tell you. And when I asked, did you take a photo of it? He goes, no, why would you ever? Like, yeah. No, everyone said the same thing. I'm not. No, no, no. We would look it up, but, but no one's taking a picture of it. Because I was like, do you or your roommates have a photo? He goes, why would anyone take a photo of it? Like, it's in everyone I've talked to, same response. No what? way I'd take a photo. Like, you know not to touch this. Yeah. And so my, my here, and if I was a landlord, this is what I've always thought. Those landlords that didn't want us to see it. Yeah. This landlord who says Don't it's not on. there. Yeah. Why wouldn't you just paint over it? And so my point is, can they not see it? Are they too afraid to touch it? Like, why is it still there? Because if I bought the house as a landlord and I went into the basement and saw this thing, bad feeling or not, I would probably be like, dude, I got to paint over this because I can't have people seeing this. This is really bizarre. Like, this is really, really weird. This isn't a pentagram. This isn't a picture of Satan. This isn't any kind of Wiccan stuff. Like, this is really bizarre looking. I have to get rid of it. No one's covered it up. In over 20 years, 20 years, it's still there. I, I I don't hope that it's still there, but I assume it must be. But why is no one painting over it? Why is no one taking photos of it? I have no idea. But there it is, you know? It's so I weird. Say, I almost have to see so this weird. now. The, you have to know that there's a, a certain way to get rid of it, first of all. That's why I wouldn't take a picture of it. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't t touch it. I wouldn't be around it. Because if you just paint over it, you're screwed. You, there's a yeah, certain it, it doesn't way. make it go away. No, it doesn't make it go it away. It probably would intensify things, but there is a certain process like to get rid of that symbol that like your boy, the demonologist might know or, or some, mm -hmm. you know, medium or something mm. could know. But um, boy, that symbol is really right away when you said that. I'm like, I sat up a little straighter. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> and it's crazy. Like one last story about the house, because there's so many, and this isn't in the podcast either. So when it was finally time to move out, we were so afraid of this house because of all the things we experienced that we were packed days in advance. We had brought all the boxes down to the back door, which is where we'd be pulling everything out of everyone's boxes organized. I mean, literally sleeping on mattresses for days because we were like, we got to get out of here the first day we could move out. We also didn't want to scare any of our family members and tell them what was going on. So no one really knew. But at the same time, the other fear was we don't want anybody having a heart attack, moms or dads. Like we don't want our families in this house for longer than they have to be. So we were packed and ready to go. We moved out. That is the most effectively and efficiently I've ever moved in my entire life <laughs> for a, a group of college kids yeah. done. But, but here's what's so weird. Like I can't explain this and this is weird. All of a sudden my, my boyfriend, now husband's father says, who's doing laundry? And we go, what are you talking about? There's no laundry detergent in the house. We're all packed up. We go over to the washing machine and open it. And the washer is running full of soap and it's full of clothes. We reach in, we pull out this weird clothing, weird clothing. It's no one, none of ours. We drop it back in, we shut it. And all the parents are now saying, who's doing what? And we said, let it go. It, <laughs> get, out of, get out of the house, let it go. Whatever that is, let it go. And the way we were moving out with the groups of people, nobody could have come in the house. And even if somebody came in the house, where's the soap? Who's doing laundry? We knew it instantly. 
it was something in the house trying to get the attention of our parents, trying to do something weird. Damn. Something was coming. Well, it had a and new audience. Did. Right. You're leaving the you're leaving the theater. It knew it. Yeah, I need a new I need a new patron to feed me energy. It was so weird. Oh, and there's no and none Jesus. of us knew. And I remember pulling out the clothes and us looking and it was these weird clothes and we were just like like hot what topic goth kid clothes or what are we talking here? Colonial garb, peasant <laughs> Flemish women. More like weird, like that. Like I don't know, like Scarlet children letter. of the porn clothes. Yeah, yeah, like like something weird. Like it was weird clothing. The it was village. not like yeah. t-shirts or like it was just weird fabrics and clothings. And it was none of ours. And there was no laundry detergent in the house. There was no soap. And this thing was running as if somebody just loaded it. And it just started like, out of nowhere. But it's so funny how you frame that and Bigo, that as well. Like, let's just go. No, don't yeah, worry. Don't even it, wait. If the house is on fire right now, we're leaving. We're leaving. It and I remember all matter. the parents. Yeah, I remember Adam's dad. I remember Amber's parents going, we can't just leave laundry. We go, no. Yes, we can. Yeah, we go can. now. We shut the door. Sure Everyone so. leave. Everyone leave. Because our fear was, I remember us even discussing it. It could give someone a heart attack, one of yeah. our parents. We so, can't have them here for very long. So to give some veracity to that one as well, um, the gentleman that Mike's kind of alluded to a couple of times, and we'll definitely have to talk to you about him off air. And just, I don't like to blow too much smoke at it in case, you know, I don't want to give him too much more people on it if, if it sometimes becomes too much heat for him but he acquired his house because the gentleman who lived in it just up and moved one day everything left everything in the house the way it was but took his family and him and left but like all of the dressers all the clothes all everything the furniture was everything was yep. as is when the current owner came and bought it <laughs> I don't know how many years later it just stood in time and nobody would move in there. And this guy was like a bishop priest or a, 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 a pastor or something like that to where he was just like, nope, I'm gone. Like it conflicted way too hard with his uh, uh, theological tendencies and, and whatever was going on definitely, you know, rivaled that. And he was like, I can't, well, I can't wrap my head around the this. house was built by a Freemason that was obsessed with. You know, 90 degree uh, angles, different and angles and geometry and all those things. So, you know, that'd be interesting. My to theory look at her is, house. I know, my theory is, is, build is with that is, you know, it's kind of like um, the 13 Ghosts, the last Ghostbusters movie. Last Ghost, I didn't see that one yet. No, stop. Oh my gosh, bro. Seen it yet. Come on. No, come on, man. I don't have but all the basically the, you know, the building in, um, the first Ghostbusters was an is created by right. It's an, it's an oh yeah, yeah. Go, it's, it's, so in the second <laughs> one, the one with um, still with Bill Murray and Dan Aykroyd, I mean, yeah. the whole building's like built for or whatever it is. It's built for the God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's like essentially to bring them back, like the geometry, the building itself is like this sacrificial ritualistic building. Sure. That's opening this portal. And, uh, you know, is that what Tom's house is potentially or, you know, I think the symbol is more related with, with um, you know, the, I don't know if it has anything to do with the house, but I think it's all connected to the symbol. Whereas I think Tom's house itself is some kind of a magnet, but it's all. I, I, don't, I don't know how to put. I can't point to anything as like this is it or that's it or the symbol or maybe it's a symbol. Maybe it's the house. Maybe it's just a location. Maybe it's a demon that's been there forever. Who? I cannot unequivocally ever. How you would need such a there? wide variety of samples to get any kind of like, well, this is out all the day. Like, I'm excited to see where this goes. Lindsay, I mean, this is yeah. still an ongoing story. My brain is in my hurt opinion. For days. I mean, that's the exciting thing, I think, for me. And looking at what you're about to, I mean, I think the podcast in this series is just the first step for you. I was about to say, this is like the appetizer of the chilling. Right. I can't wait to see the next yeah. iteration of the chilling. Yes. I'll have my popcorn. Well, yeah. Ready. That's my hope. I'm hoping that someday someone says, hey, like, let's get a team together and a really good film crew and let's go do this the right way. Because, you know, I know people want to make things bigger for TV, but I know for I know for a fact... We go in this house, It's we're going to figure out a lot of stuff. And right. then to have somebody get rid of what's there forever would be my goal. Like, get it out of here. Absolutely. And I really think, I, my, my vibe has always been that whatever this thing is, was more part of like the land or the area. And then whoever put that symbol in there, 
it was like a beacon, like mm-hmm. a portal or a beacon that that thing went, oh, like, here I go. Like, I think it's been in the, I get that vibe. Like it's ancient, it's old, it was in the area and some idiot or maybe it made someone do it. I don't know, put that there. And it's such a source of energy for it because again, no one's painting over it. It makes everyone uncomfortable. No one will take a photo of it. I mean, this symbol is something like tangible to the point where you physically feel affected by it. So whatever it is, is certainly either what brought it there or gives it power or something. Wow. There I got to, go. ha- I hate to say I need to see it. I need, I, I, I want to know Not what me. it looks like. I'm good. Uh, maybe I won't take a picture of it, but I kind of. Well, if, if I ever get the chance to go back, I'm going to try to have the guts to just take a photo of it. You know, if I can ever get down in that basement, whether it's for a show or something, yeah. like, I would give anything. But it's just crazy that everybody I talk to is like, no, why would I ever? No, no, I don't do that. No one takes a photo of it. And it's like, yeah, yeah I get I get well, it. We we didn't either. So yeah. I get it. But yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, I've only been through Kent very sparingly limited in my life. I've been there one time for a good weekend, right? And really got a good kind of like cross section of it. it was cold it was in october time for a concert and just i didn't know how like steeped in like you know halloween and uh that kind of vibe kent gets during that time i mean it's pretty robust so i mean this story playing into that area and talking about you know maybe it's just historically been here i mean yeah that tracks right like yeah there's a lot of vibe to that area in general already right yeah I- and historically, I worked with a historian on the show as well, who's a local historian who really found out a lot about the property and the land and all these things. So, yeah, I mean, it puts it on track energetically. Sure. I don't see why something like that wouldn't be around, you know, and mm-hmm. I just think that symbol did something. That's all I know for sure. Wow. Well, there yeah. you go, ladies and gentlemen. Color me interested. Uh, Lindsey Brisbane, The Chilling. Y'all got to check this out. I'm wearing a hoodie because uh, I'm cold. Yeah. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we all the links will be in the description. Uh, go check out season two. Well, first, you got to check out season one. Yeah. She just came out with season two. Lindsey, is there anything you want to let us know? Uh, anything to promote or uh, send us out with some last words? Yeah, you know, first and foremost, you know, my my show is a, a cautionary tale as to what not to do and what to do in a haunting and what it's like to live with a demon. So again, if you listen, be ready because um, there are some pretty scary parts, um, but also some some really interesting things in there as well. And, you know, season two, it's more me just talking to friends and family and different guests because when you're the person who has lived in the most haunted house that anyone's ever heard of, everyone comes to you with your their stories. So seasons two is kind of like a break from season one and giving other people a chance to talk is the goal. And I do possibly have another big story about another possible haunting. You know, again, season one took me three years to put together. So, you know, who knows when this other story could become something, but I certainly hope it will. So yeah, I mean... Just be safe out there, guys. Don't paint symbols on walls and <laughs> don't play with Ouija boards and no. don't do some, nope. if you don't know what you're doing, just don't do it. Cause I'm here to tell you when you live with something like we did, um, it really changes your perception on what these things are capable of. So, you know, be smart, guys. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Thank you so much, that was Lindsay. Awesome. That was fire. I mean, I appreciate you making the time to come on the show. I'm so glad we connected. Yeah. And uh, yeah. we're going to come back. Uh, we're going to say goodbye, but we'll come back and, and do a proper goodbye with Lindsay. We're going to outro the show. Lindsay, thank you again. Wonderful. You're awesome. I can't wow. wait to hear more. Thank you. Thank you guys for having me on. I appreciated it, and I love talking with you both. Oh, that was great. Take care. Next time. Man. There's going to be a next time. There's going to have to be a next time. <laughs> Jeez. <I'm... laughs> that was sweet. Wow. What a great episode. I feel like there's weird energy in the studio right now. We're going to have to get out, bust out the sage and the Palo Santo. I think uh, after this episode, I'm like blown. Just away. getting chills. And yeah. So I'm trying to think of this. There used to be a podcast I listened to, and it was kind of like Monsters Among Us, but it was more of like there was just one person that always narrated the stories. <laughs> I can't remember if it's all like, I think I want to say it's called like Darkness Prevails. Yeah. And it's just story after story after story of just crazy, creepy, weird stories where you're like, no, I can't believe that. And like, 
some of the stuff that she was this saying one's really unique. tracked back to some They're, of these yeah, right. wild stories yeah, where I was like, yeah. no, dude, no, yeah. no, I'd be out. Yeah. Like, there's a lot happening there. There's, like, a Christine vibe. Like, you know, somebody's, like, the Arnie of the house <laughs> where, like, the, the demon is, like, almost in them. But then it's shifting between all of them. Yeah, doing different things to everyone. It's, like, wearing them around, like, different styles. Like, oh, today I'm Lindsay. Now I'm Amber. Yeah, that's now I'm Rebecca. Weird. Like, I couldn't do that, dude. And honestly, though... I find it really interesting is the part of where it was like you just didn't talk about it. Like yeah. Even her and her boyfriend slash husband now, they both like see the fan that's not plugged in and like they just that don't don't talk was, about that it. That blew my mind. The fan. You don't talk uh, I mean, about other it. Other things as well, but, but you don't talk about it. That's the I don't that's care about he was the fan. Like, oh boy. The weird thing this to me just is got, not you can't talk about it even. That's yeah. almost like where it's like, man, it's got everybody in this kind of like Yeah. They're all choke experiencing hold. it. It's like a chokehold. It's not a. It's not an alternate reality. It's really their reality, but they just can't talk about the reality. Even like it's 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 wild. Tell. I can't wait to listen to that entire series. Okay, I'm in. We're going in. Yeah, game on. All right, guys. I need a pizza though. This has been fun. Wow, what an incredible episode this was. Uh, again, you guys can follow us on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter at The Strange Road. Facebook group, Strange Road Hitchhikers. And as you can probably tell, Bub and I uh, are wearing some new gear. We're testing out some, getting a couple We're more trying. proofs. We're trying. Um, but working on some different designs. And Still got and, the sticker on this one. Yeah, you do. You didn't even take the tag <laughs> off, bro. That one just came in today. Just got it today. So, uh, yeah, big things coming with the merch portal. We're close. We are close. Um, and and you guys can listen everywhere. Check us out on YouTube. We appreciate the heck out of all Give of you. Give us a like. Give us a share. Yeah. All of it. Thank you, guys. Oh, thank you to Disbro and Stoner, both. And Master, Master Control. Control. Uh, as always, those guys killing it. They're awesome. All right. Signing out, guys. Peace.